Chapter Eight of The Ordeal of Mark Twain by Van Wyck Brooks. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by John Greenman. Chapter Eight Those Extraordinary Twins. Joy with us is the monopoly of disreputable characters. Alexander Harvey. At the circus, no doubt, you have watched some trained lion going through the sad motions of a career to which the tyrannical curiosity of men has constrained him. At times he seems to be playing his part with a certain zest. He has acquired a new set of superficial habits, and you would say that he finds them easy and pleasant. Under the surface, however, he remains the wild, exuberant creature of the jungle. It is only thanks to the eternal vigilance of his trainers, and the guiding lines they provide for him in the shape of the ring, the rack, and all the rest of the circus paraphernalia, that he continues to enact this parody of his true life. Have his instincts been modified by the imposition of these new habits? Look at him at the moment when the trainer ceases to crack his whip and turns his back. In a flash another self has possessed him. In his glance, in his furtive gesture, you perceive the king of beasts once more. The sawdust of the circus has become the sand of the desert. Twenty thousand years have rolled back in the twinkling of an eye. So it was with Mark Twain. We have no real morals, he wrote in one of his later letters, but only artificial ones, morals created and preserved by the forced suppression of natural and healthy instincts. Now that is not true of the man who is master of himself. The morality of the free man is not based upon the suppression of his instincts, but upon the discreet employment of them. It is a real and not an artificial morality, therefore, because the whole man subscribes to it. Mark Twain, as we have seen, had conformed to a moral regime in which the profoundest of his instincts could not function. The artist had been submerged in the bourgeois gentleman, the man of business, the respectable Presbyterian citizen. To play his part, therefore, he had to depend upon the cues his wife and his friends gave him. Here we have the explanation of his statement, Outside influences, outside circumstances, wind the man and regulate him. Left to himself, he wouldn't get regulated at all and the sort of time he would keep would not be valuable. We can see from this how completely his conscious self had accepted the point of view of his trainers, how fully he had concurred in their desire to repress that unmanageable creative instinct of his, how ashamed, in short, he was of it. Nevertheless, that instinct, while repressed, while unconscious, continued to live and manifest itself just the same. We shall see that, in the end, never having been able to develop, to express itself, to fulfill itself, to air itself in the sun and the wind of the world, it turned, as it were, black and malignant, like some monstrous, morbid inner growth, poisoning Mark Twain's whole spiritual system. We have now to note its constant blind efforts to break through the censorship that had been imposed on it to cross the threshold of the unconscious and play its part in the conscious life of this man whose will was always enlisted against it. First of all, a few instances from his everyday life. We know that he was always chafing against the scheme of values, the whole social regime that was represented by his wife and his friends. His conscious self urged him to maintain these values and this regime his unconscious self strove against them, vetoed the force behind his will, pushed him in just the opposite direction. We find this conflict revealed in his story Those Extraordinary Twins, about an Italian counterpart of the famous Siamese monstrosity. Whenever Luigi had possession of the legs, he carried Angelo to balls, rum shops, sons of liberty parades, horse races, campaign riots, and everywhere else that could damage him with his party and his church. 
and when it was Angelo's week he carried Luigi diligently to all manner of moral and religious gatherings, doing his best to regain the ground he had lost. This story of the two incompatible spirits bound together in one flesh is, as we can see, the symbol of Mark Twain himself. Glance at his business life. He pursued it with frantic eagerness, urged on by the self that loved success, popularity, prestige. Yet he was always in revolt against it. There were years during which he walked the floor at night, overwrought and unsettled, as he said, by apprehensions, badgered, harassed, and let us add Mr. Payne's adjectives, worried, impatient, rash, frenzied, and altogether upset till he had to beg the fates for mercy, till he had to send his agent the pathetic imploring appeal, Get me out of business! Why did he always fail in those spectacular ventures of his? Was it not because his will, which was enlisted in business, was not supported by a constant fundamental desire to succeed in it? Because, in fact, his fundamental desire pointed him just the other way. Then there was his conventional domestic and social life. He had submerged himself in the role of the husband, the father, the neighbor, the citizen. At once he became the most absent-minded of men. His absent-mindedness, Mr. Paine assures us, was by no means a development of old age, and he mentions two typical instances of it when Mark Twain was in the very heyday of his mental strength. Once, when the house was being cleaned, he failed to recognize the pictures in his own drawing-room when he found them on the floor, and accused an innocent caller of having brought them there to sell. Plainly the eye of the householder was not confirmed by the instinctive love that makes one observant. The vagrant artist in him, in fact, was always protesting against the lot his other self had so fully accepted, the lot of being bully-ragged, as he said, by builders and architects and tapestry devils and carpet idiots and billiard-table scoundrels and wildcat gardeners, when what was really needed was an incendiary. Moreover, he was always forgetting engagements, we are told, or getting them wrong. And this absent-mindedness had its tragic results, too, for because of it, to his own everlasting remorse, Mark Twain became the innocent cause of the death of one of his children, and only just escaped being the cause of the death of another. On one occasion he was driving with his year-old son on a snowy day, and was so extraordinarily negligent that he let him catch a severe cold, which developed into a fatal pneumonia. On the other, when he was out with one of his little daughters, he inadvertently let go of the perambulator, and the baby, after a frightful slide down a steep hill, tumbled out with her head bleeding among the stones by the roadside. "'I should not have been permitted to do it,' he said of this first misadventure. I was not qualified for any such responsibility as that. Someone should have gone who had at least the rudiments of a mind. Necessarily I would lose myself dreaming. Yes, Mark Twain was daydreaming. That mind in which the filial and paternal instincts had almost supplanted every other caught itself wandering at the critical hour and in that hour the old Adam, the natural man, the suppressed poet, registered its tragic protest, took its revenge against a life that had left no room for it. Truth comes out in the end. The most significant comment on Mark Twain's constant absent-mindedness as regards domestic matters is to be found in Mr. Paine's record that in his dictations in old age he was extremely inaccurate on every subject except the genesis and writing of his books. We can see from this that although his conscious life had been overwhelmingly occupied with non-artistic and anti-artistic interests, his heart 
as we say, had always been not in them but in literature. And how can we explain the fervor with which this comrade of Presbyterian ministers and pillars of society, this husband of that heavenly whiteness, Mrs. Clemens, jots in his notebook observations like the following. We may not doubt that society in heaven consists mainly of undesirable persons. How can we explain that intemperate, that vehement, that furious obsession of animosity against the novels of Jane Austen, except as an indirect venting of his hatred of the primness and priggishness of his own entourage. I should go even further. I should be even more specific than this. Mr. Howells had been Mark Twain's literary mentor. Mr. Howells had licked him into shape, had regenerated him artistically, as his wife had regenerated him socially. Mr. Howells had set his pace for him, and Mark Twain, the candidate for gentility, had been overflowingly grateful. Possibly, he had written to his father confessor, possibly you will not be a fully accepted classic until you have been dead one hundred years. It is the fate of the Shakespeare's of all genuine professions but then your books will be as common as Bibles, I believe. In that day I shall be in the encyclopedias too, thus. Mark Twain, history and occupation unknown, but he was personally acquainted with Howells. We know, as a matter of fact, that he delighted in the delicacy of Howells' mind and language, but this taste was wholly unrelated to anything else in Mark Twain's literary horizon. We can say with all the more certainty, because he detested novels in general, that if Howells' novels had been written by any one else than his friend and his mentor, he would have ignored them, as he ignored all other artistic writing. He would even have despised them as he despised all insipid writing. In short, this taste was a product of personal affection and gratitude. It was precisely on a par with his attitude toward the provincial social daintiness of his wife. And in both cases, just in the measure that his conscious self had accepted these alien standards that had been imposed upon him, his unconscious self revolted against them. "'I never saw a woman so hard to please.' he writes in 1875, about things she doesn't know anything about. Mr. Paine hastens to assure us that the reference to his wife's criticism in this is tenderly playful as always. But what a multitude of dark secrets that tender playfulness covers! Mark Twain's unconscious self barely discloses its claws in phrases like that, enough to show how strict was the censorship he had accepted. It cannot express itself directly. Consequently, like a child who, desiring to strike its teacher, stamps upon the floor instead, it pours out its accumulated bitterness obliquely. When Mark Twain utters such characteristic aphorisms as, Heaven for climate, hell for society, we see the repressed artist in him striking out at Mrs. Clemens, and the Reverend Joseph Twitchell, whose companionship the dominant Mark Twain called, and with reason, for he seems to have been the most lovable of men, a companionship which to me stands first after Livy's. Similarly, when he roars and rages against the novels of Jane Austen, we can see that buried self taking vengeance upon Mr. Howells, with whom Jane Austen was a prime passion, who had even taken Jane Austen as a model. We know the constraint to which he submitted as regards religious observances. And once or twice, he writes, I smooched a Sunday when the boss wasn't looking. Nothing is half so good as literature hooked on Sunday on the sly. Does it not explain the bitter animus that lies behind his comical complaint of George W. Cable when the two were together on a lecture tour? 
you will never never know never divine guess imagine how loathsome a thing the christian religion can be made until you come to know and study cable daily and hourly he has taught me to abhor and detest the sabbath day and hunt up new and troublesome ways to dishonor it habitually as we have seen he spoke of himself in public as a presbyterian as twichell's parishioner his buried self redressed the balance in a passionate admiration for robert ingersoll the atheist thank you most heartily for the books he writes to ingersoll in eighteen seventy nine i am devouring them they have found a hungry place and they content it and satisfy it to a miracle what in fact were the books he loved best we find him reading andrew d white's science and religion lecky's european morals and similar books of a rationalistic tendency but his favorite authors after voltaire whom he had read as a pilot were pepys suetonius and saint-simon saint-simon's memoirs he said he had read twenty times and we gather that he almost learned by heart suetonius's record of the cruelties and licentiousness of imperial rome why did he take such passionate pleasure in books of this kind in writers who had so freely spoken out hear what he says in nineteen o four regarding his own book what is man am i honest i give you my word of honor privately i am not for seven years i have suppressed a book which my conscience tells me i ought to publish i hold it a duty to publish it there are other difficult tasks i am equal to but i am not equal to that one and when at last he did publish it anonymously it was with this foreword every thought in them these papers has been thought and accepted as unassailable truth by millions upon millions of men and concealed kept private why did they not speak out because they dreaded and could not bear the disapproval of the people around them why have not i published the same reason has restrained me i think i can find no other there we see in all its absolutism the censorship under which his creative self was laboring one can easily understand his love for saint-simon and casanova and why in private he was perpetually praising their unrestrained frankness and is there any other explanation of his elizabethan breadth of parlance mr howells confesses that he sometimes blushed over mark twain's letters that there were some which to the very day when he wrote his eulogy on his dead friend he could not bear to re-read perhaps if he had not so insisted in former years while going over mark twain's proofs upon having that swearing out in an instant he would never have had cause to suffer from his having loosed his bold fancy to stoop on rank suggestion mark twain's verbal rabelaisianism was obviously the expression of that vital sap which not having been permitted to inform his work had been driven inward and left there to ferment no wonder he was always indulging in orgies of forbidden words consider the famous book sixteen o one that fireside conversation in the time of queen elizabeth is there any obsolete verbal indecency in the english language that mark twain has not painstakingly resurrected and assembled there he whose blood was in constant ferment and who could not contain within the narrow bonds that had been set for him the riotous exuberance of his nature had to have an escape valve 
and he poured through it a fetid stream of meaningless obscenity, the waste of a priceless psychic material. Mr. Paine speaks of an address he made at a certain stomach club in Paris, which has obtained a wide celebrity among the clubs of the world, though no line of it, or even its title, has ever found its way into published literature. And who has not heard one or two of the innumerable Mark Twain anecdotes in the same vein that are current in every New York publishing house? In all these ways, I say, these blind, indirect, extravagant, wasteful ways, the creative self in Mark Twain constantly strove to break through the censorship his own will had accepted, to cross the threshold of the unconscious. A literary imp, says Mr. Paine, was always lying in wait for Mark Twain, the imp of the burlesque, tempting him to do the outré, the outlandish, the shocking thing. It was this that Olivia Clemens had to labor hardest against. Well, she labored, and well Mark Twain labored with her. It was the spirit of the artist bent upon upsetting the whole apple-cart of bourgeois conventions. They could, and they did, keep it in check. They arrested it, and manhandled it, and thrust it back. They shamed it, and heaped scorn upon it, and prevented it from interfering too much with the respectable tenor of their daily search for prestige and success. They could baffle it, and distort it, and oblige it to assume ever more complicated and grotesque disguises in order to elude them, but they could not kill it. In ways of which they were unaware it escaped their vigilance, and registered itself in a sort of cipher for us of another generation who have eyes to read upon the texture of Mark Twain's writings. For is it not perfectly plain that Mark Twain's books are shot through with all sorts of unconscious revelations of this internal conflict? In the Freudian psychology the dream is an expression of a suppressed wish. In dreams we do what our inner selves desire to do, but have been prevented from doing either by the exigencies of our daily routine, or by the obstacles of convention, or by some other form of censorship which has been imposed upon us, or which we ourselves, actuated by some contrary desire, have willingly accepted. Many other dreams, however, are not so simple. They are often incoherent, nonsensical, absurd. In such cases it is because two opposed wishes, neither of which is fully satisfied, have met one another and resulted in a compromise, a compromise that is often as apparently chaotic as the collision of two railway trains running at full speed. These mechanisms, the mechanisms of the wish-fulfillment and the wish-conflict, are evident, as Freud has shown, in many of the phenomena of everyday life. Whenever, for any reason, the censorship is relaxed, the censor is off guard. Whenever we are daydreaming and give way to our idle thoughts, then the unconscious bestirs itself and rises to the surface, gives utterance to those embarrassing slips of the tongue, those tender playfulnesses that express our covert intentions slays our adversaries, sets our fancies wandering in pursuit of all the ideals and all the satisfactions upon which our customary life has stamped its veto. In Mark Twain's books, or rather in a certain group of them, his fantasies, we can see this process at work. Certain significant obsessions reveal themselves there, certain fixed ideas. The same themes recur again and again. I am writing from the grave, he notes in later life, regarding some manuscripts that are not to be published until after his death. On these terms only can a man be approximately frank. He cannot be straightly and unqualifiedly frank, either in the grave or out of it. When he wrote Captain Stormfield's Visit to Heaven, Puddinhead Wilson, the American claimant, those extraordinary twins, he was frank without knowing it. 
He, the unconscious artist, who, when he wrote his autobiography, found that he was unable to tell the truth about himself, has conducted us unawares in these writings into the penetralia of his soul. Let us note, prefatorily, that in each case Mark Twain was peculiarly, for the time being, free of his censorship, that he wrote at least the first draft of Captain Stormfield, in reckless disregard of it, is proved by the fact that for forty years he did not dare to publish the book at all, but kept it locked away in his safe. As for the American claimant, Puddinhead Wilson and those extraordinary twins, he wrote them at the time of the failure of the page typesetting machine. Shortly before, he had been on the dizziest pinnacle of a worldly expectation. Calculating what his returns from the machine were going to be, he had covered pages, according to Mr. Paine, with figures that never ran short of millions, and frequently approached the billion mark. Then suddenly, reduced to virtual bankruptcy, he found himself once more dependent upon authorship for a living. He had passed, in short, through a profound, nervous, and emotional cataclysm. So disturbed were his affairs, so disordered was everything, we are told, that sometimes he felt himself as one walking amid unrealities. At such times, we know, the bars of the spirit fall down people commit all sorts of aberrations, go off the handle, as we say. The moral habits of a lifetime give way, and man becomes more or less an irresponsible animal. In Mark Twain's case, at least, the result was a violent effort on the part of his suppressed self to assert its supremacy in a propitious moment when that other self, the businessman, had proved abysmally weak. That is why these books that marked his return to literature appear to have the quality of nightmares. He has told us in the preface to Those Extraordinary Twins that the story had originally been a part of Puddinhead Wilson. He had seen a picture of an Italian monstrosity like the Siamese twins, and had meant to write an extravagant farce about them. But he adds, The story changed itself from a farce to a tragedy while I was going along with it, a most embarrassing circumstance. Eventually he realized that it was not one story but two stories tangled together that he was trying to tell, so he removed the twins from Puddinhead Wilson and printed the two tales separately. That alone shows us the confusion of his mind the confusion revealed further in the American claimant and in Puddinhead Wilson as it stands. They are, I say, like nightmares, these books, full of passionate conviction that turns into a burlesque of itself, angry satire, hysterical humor. They are triple-headed chimeras, in short, that leave the reader's mind in tumult and dismay. The censor has so far relaxed its hold that the unconscious has risen up to the surface, the battle of the two Mark Twains takes place almost in the open, under our very eyes. Glance now among these dreams at a simple example of wish-fulfillment. When Captain Stormfield arrives in heaven, he is surprised to find that all sorts of people are esteemed among the celestials who have had no esteem at all on earth. Among them is Edward J. Billings of Tennessee. He was a poet during his lifetime but the Tennessee village folk scoffed at him. They would have none of him. They made cruel sport of him. In heaven things are different. There the celestials recognize the divinity of his spirit, and in token of this Shakespeare and Homer walk backward before him. Here, as we see, Mark Twain is unconsciously describing the actual fate of his own spirit, and that ample other fate his spirit desires. It is the story of Cinderella, the despised stepsister who is vindicated by the prince's favor, rewritten in terms personal to the author. We note the significant parallel that the Tennessee village, where the unappreciated poet lived to the scornful amusement of his neighbors, is a duplicate of the village in which Mark Twain had grown up, the milieu of Huck Finn and Tom Sawyer. 
this inference is corroborated by the similar plight of pudd'nhead wilson the sardonic philosopher whom we should have identified with mark twain even if the latter had not repeatedly assured us that an author draws himself in all his characters even if we did not know that pudd'nhead's calendar was so far mark twain's own calendar that he continued it in two later books following the equator and a double-barreled detective story pudd'nhead in short is simply another edward j billings and the village folk treat him in just the same fashion for some years says the author wilson had been privately at work on a whimsical almanac for his amusement a calendar with a little dab of ostensible philosophy usually in ironical form appended to each date and the judge thought that these quips and fancies of wilson's were neatly turned and cute so he carried a handful of them around one day and read them to some of the chief citizens but irony was not for those people their mental vision was not focused for it they read those playful trifles in the solidest earnest and decided without hesitancy that if there ever had been any doubt that dave wilson was a puddin'-head which there hadn't this revelation removed that doubt for good and all and hear how the half-breed tom driscoll baits him before all the people in the square dave's just an all-round genius a genius of the first water gentlemen a great scientist running to seed here in this village a prophet with the kind of honor that prophets generally get at home for here they don't give shucks for his scientifics they call his skull a notion factory hey dave ain't it so come dave show the gentleman what an inspired jack-at-all science we've got in this town and don't know it is it possible to doubt that here more than half consciously mark twain was picturing the fate that had in so real a sense made a buffoon of him hardly when we consider the vindictive delight with which he pictures pudd'nhead out maneuvering the village folk and triumphing over them in the end observe now the deadly temperamental earnestness of the man that corrupted hadleyburg a story written late in life when his great fame and position enabled him to override the censorship and speak with more or less candor the temptation and the downfall of a whole town says mr paine was a colossal idea a sardonic idea and it is colossally and sardonically worked out human weakness and rotten moral force were never stripped so bare or so mercilessly jeered at in the market-place for once mark twain could hug himself with glee in derision of self-righteousness knowing that the world would laugh with him and that none would be so bold as to gainsay his mockery probably no one but mark twain ever conceived the idea of demoralizing a whole community of making its nineteen leading citizens ridiculous by leading them into a cheap glittering temptation and having them yield and openly perjure themselves at the very moment when their boasted incorruptibility was to amaze the world it was the leading citizens the pillars of society mark twain had himself been hobnobbing with all those years the very people in deference to whom he had suppressed his true opinions his real desires who despised him for what he was and admired him only for the success he had attained in spite of it it was these people his friends who had in so actual a sense imposed upon him that he attacks in this terrible story of the passing stranger who took such a vitriolic joy in exposing their pretensions and their hypocrisy i passed through your town at a certain time and received a deep offence 
which I had not earned. I wanted to damage every man in the place and every woman. Is not that the unmistakable voice of the misprized poet and philosopher in Mark Twain, the worm that has turned, the angel that has grown diabolic in a world that has refused to recognize its divinity? Here, I say, in these two or three instances, we have the wish-fulfillment in its clearest form. Elsewhere we find the wish, the desire of the suppressed poet for self-effectuation, expressing itself in many vague hopes and vague regrets. It is the sentiment of the suppressed poet in all of us that he voices in his letter to Howells about the latter's novel, Indian Summer, saying that it gives a body a cloudy sense of his having been a prince once in some enchanted far-off land and of being an exile now and desolate and lord no chance ever to get back there again and consider the unfinished tale of the mysterious chamber the story as mr paine describes it of a young lover who is accidentally locked behind a secret door in an old castle and cannot announce himself he wanders at last down into subterranean passages beneath the castle and he lives in this isolation for twenty years there is something inescapably personal about that as for the character of the colonel sellers of the american claimant so different from the colonel sellers of the gilded age who is supposed to be the same man and whom mark twain had drawn after one of his uncles every one has noted that it is a burlesque upon his own preposterous business life isn't it more than this that rightful claimant to the great title of nobility living in exile among those fantastic dreams of wealth that always deceive him isn't he the obscure projection of the lost heir in mark twain himself inept in the business life he is living incapable of substantiating his claim and yet forever beguiled by the hope that some day he is going to win his true rank and live the life he was intended for the shadowy claim of mark twain's mother's family to an english earldom is not sufficient to account for his constant preoccupation with this idea just before mark twain's death he recalled says mr paine one of his old subjects dual personality and discussed various instances that flitted through his mind jekyll and hyde phases in literature and fact one of his old subjects dual personality could he ever have been aware of the extent to which his writings revealed that conflict in himself why was he so obsessed by journalistic facts like the siamese twins and the tickborn case with its theme of the lost heir and the usurper why is it that the idea of changelings in the cradle perpetually haunted his mind as we can see from puddenhead wilson and the gilded age and the variation of it that constitutes the prince and the pauper the prince who has submerged himself in the role of the beggar boy mark twain has drawn himself there just as he has drawn himself in the william wilson theme of the facts concerning the recent carnival of crime in connecticut where he ends by dramatically slaying the conscience that torments him and as for that pair of incompatibles bound together in one flesh the extraordinary twins the good boy who has followed the injunctions of his mother and the bad boy of whom society disapproves how many of mark twain's stories and anecdotes turn upon that same theme that same juxtaposition does he not reveal there in all its nakedness as i have said the true history of his life we have observed that in puddenhead's aphorisms mark twain was expressing his true opinions the opinions of the cynic he had become owing to the suppression and the constant curdling as it were of the poet in him while his pioneer self was singing the praises of american progress and writing a connecticut yankee at the court of king arthur the disappointed poet kept up a refrain like this october twelfth the discovery it was wonderful to find america 
but it would have been more wonderful to lose it in all this group of writings we have been discussing however we can see that while the censorship had been sufficiently relaxed in the general confusion of his life to permit his unconscious to rise to the surface it was still vigilant enough to cloak its real intentions it is in secret that pudd'nhead jots down his saturnine philosophy it is only in secret in a private diary like pudd'nhead's that young lord berkeley in the american claimant thinks of recording his views of this fraudulent democracy where prosperity and position constitute rank here as in the malevolent mephistophelian passing stranger of the man that corrupted halleyburg mark twain frankly imagines himself but he does so we perceive only by taking cover behind a device that enables him to save his face and make good his retreat Puddenhead is only a crack-brained fool about things in general, even if he is pretty clever with his fingerprint invention. Otherwise he would find something better to do than to spend his time writing nonsense. And as for Lord Berkeley, how could you expect a young English snob to know anything about democracy? That was the reaction upon which Mark Twain could safely count in his readers. They would only be fooling themselves, of course they would know that they were fooling themselves but in order to keep up the great american game of bluff they would have to forgive him as long as he never hit below the belt by speaking in his own person in short he was perfectly secure and mark twain the humorist who held the public in the hollow of his hand knew it it is only after some such explanation as this that we can understand the supremacy among all mark twain's writings of huckleberry finn through the character of huck that disreputable illiterate little boy as mrs clemens no doubt thought him he was licensed to let himself go we have seen how indifferent his sponsors were to the writing and the fate of this book nobody says mr paine appears to have been especially concerned about huck except possibly the publisher the more indifferent they were the freer was mark twain anything that little vagabond said might be safely trusted to pass the censor just because he was a little vagabond just because as an irresponsible boy he could not in the eyes of the mighty ones of this world know anything in any case about life morals and civilization that mark twain was almost if not quite conscious of his opportunity we can see from his introductory note to the book persons attempting to find a motive in this narrative will be prosecuted persons attempting to find a moral in it will be banished persons attempting to find a plot in it will be shot he feels so secure of himself that he can actually challenge the censor to accuse him of having a motive huck's illiteracy huck's disreputableness and general outrageousness are so many shields behind which mark twain can let all the cats out of the bag with impunity he must i say have had a certain sense of his unusual security when he wrote some of the more cynically satirical passages of the book when he permitted colonel sherburne to taunt the mob when he drew that picture of the audience who had been taken in by the duke proceeding to sell the rest of their townspeople when he has the king put up the notice ladies and children not admitted and add there if that line don't fetch them i don't know arkansas the withering contempt for humankind expressed in these episodes was of the sort that mark twain expressed more and more openly as time went on in his own person but he was not indulging in that costly kind of cynicism in the days when he wrote huckleberry finn he must therefore have appreciated the license that little vagabond like the puppet on the lap of a ventriloquist afforded him this however was only a trivial detail in his general sense of happy expansion of ecstatic liberation other places do seem so cramped up and smothery but a raft don't says huck on the river 
you feel mighty free and easy and comfortable on a raft mark twain himself was free at last that raft and that river to him were something more than mere material facts his whole unconscious life the pent-up river of his own soul had burst its bonds and rushed forth a joyous torrent do we need any other explanation of the abandon the beauty the eternal freshness of huckleberry finn perhaps we can say that a lifetime of moral slavery and repression was not too much to pay for it certainly if it flies like a gay bright shining arrow through the tepid atmosphere of american literature it is because of the straining of the bow the tautness of the string that gave it its momentum yes if we did not know if we did not feel that mark twain was intended for a vastly greater destiny for the role of the demiurge in fact we might have been glad of all those petty restrictions and misprisions he had undergone restrictions that had prepared the way for this joyous release no smoking on sundays no swearing aloud neckties having to be bothered over that everlasting diet of p's and q's petty p's and pettier q's to which mark twain had had to submit the domestic diet of mrs clemens the literary diet of mr howells those second parents who had taken the place of his first we have to thank it after all for the vengeful solace we find in the promiscuous and general revolt of huckleberry finn don't talk about it tom i've tried it and don't work it don't work tom it ain't for me i ain't used to it the widder's good to me and friendly but i can't stand them ways she makes me get up just at the same time every morning she makes me wash they comb me all that to thunder and she won't let me sleep in the woodshed i got to wear them blamed clothes that just smothers me tom they don't seem to any air get through em somehow and they're so rotten nice that i can't sit down nor lay down nor roll around anywheres i ain't slid on a cellar door for well appears to be years i got to go to church and sweat and sweat i hate them ordinary sermons i can't catch a fly in there i can't chaw i got to wear shoes all sunday the widder eats by a bell she goes to bed by a bell she gets up by a bell everything's so awful regular a body can't stand it well everybody does that way huck tom it don't make no difference i ain't everybody i can't stand it it's awful to be tied up so and grub comes too easy i, I don't take no interest in vittles that way i got to ask to go fishing i got to ask to go a-swimmin darned if i hain't got to ask to do everything well i'd got to talk so nice it wasn't no comfort i'd got to go up in the attic and rip out a while every day to get a taste in my mouth where i'd a died tom the widder wouldn't let me smoke she wouldn't let me yell she wouldn't let me gape nor stretch nor scratch before folks i had to shove tom i just had to now these clothes suits me and this barrel suits me and i ain't ever going to shake em any more this chapter began with the analogy of the lion in the circus you see what happens with mark twain when the trainer turns his back end of chapter eight those extraordinary twins read by john greenman chapter nine of the ordeal of mark twain by van wyck brooks this librivox recording is in the public domain read by john greenman chapter nine mark twain's humor to be good is noble but to show others how to be good is nobler and less trouble Budenhead wilson's new calendar and now we are ready for mark twain's humor we recall how reluctant mark twain was to adopt the humorist's career and how all his life he was in revolt against a role which as he vaguely felt had been thrust upon him 
that he considered it necessary to publish his joan of arc anonymously is only one of many proofs of a lifelong sense that mark twain was an unworthy double of samuel langhorne clemens his humorous writing he regarded as something external to himself as something other than artistic self-expression and it was in consequence of pursuing it we have divined that he was arrested in his moral and aesthetic development we have seen on the other hand that he adopted this career because his humor was the only writing he did in nevada that found an appreciative audience and that the immediate result of his decision was that he obtained from the american public the prodigious and permanent approval which his own craving for success and prestige had driven him to seek here then are the facts our discussion of mark twain's humor will have to explain we must see what that humor was and what produced it and why in following it he violated his own nature and at the same time achieved such ample material rewards it was in nevada and california that mark twain's humor of which we have evidence during the whole of his adolescence came to the front and it is a notable fact that almost every man of a literary tendency who was brought into contact with those pioneer conditions became a humorist the funny man was one of the outstanding pioneer types he was indeed virtually the sole representative of the republic of letters in the old west artemus ward orpheus c kerr petroleum v nasby dan de quill captain jack downing even bret hart sufficiently remind us of this fact plainly pioneer life had a sort of chemical effect on the creative mind instantly giving it a humorous cast plainly also the humorist was a type that pioneer society required in order to maintain its psychic equilibrium mr paine seems to have divined this in his description of western humor it is a distinct product he says it grew out of a distinct condition the battle with the frontier the fight was so desperate to take it seriously was to surrender women laughed that they might not weep men when they could no longer swear western humor was the result it is the freshest wildest humor in the world but there is tragedy behind it perhaps we can best surprise the secret of this humor by noting mark twain's instinctive reaction to the life in nevada it is evident that in many ways and in spite of his high spirits and high hopes he found that life profoundly repugnant to him he constantly confesses in his diary and letters indeed to the misery it involves i do hate to go back to the washoe he writes after a few weeks of respite from mining we fag ourselves completely out every day he describes nevada as a place where the devil would feel homesick i heard a gentleman say the other day that it was the damnedest country under the sun and that comprehensive conception i fully subscribe to it never rains here and the dew never falls no flowers grow here and no green thing gladdens the eye our city lies in the midst of a desert of the purest most unadulterated and uncompromising sand and as with the setting so with the life high strung and neurotic says mr paine the strain of newspaper work and the tumult of the comstock had told on him more than once he found it necessary this young man of twenty-eight to drop all work and rest for a time at steamboat springs a place near virginia city where there were boiling springs and steaming fissures in the mountainside and a comfortable hotel that he found the pace in california just as difficult we have his own testimony with what fervor he speaks of the damn san francisco style of wearing out life the careworn or eager anxious faces that made his brief escape to the sandwich islands god what a contrast with california and the washoe 
ever sweet and blessed in his memory. Never, in short, was a man more rasped by any social situation than was this young barbarian, as people have called him, by what people also call the free life of the West. We can see this in his profanity, which also, like his humor, came to the front in Nevada and remained one of his prominent characteristics through life. We remember how mad he was, clear through, over the famous highway robbery episode. He was always half seriously threatening to kill people. He threatened to kill his best friend Jim Gillis. To hear him denounce a thing, says Mr. Paine, was to give one the fierce, searching delight of galvanic waves. Naturally, therefore, no one in Virginia, according to one of the Gillis brothers, could resist the temptation of making Sam swear. Naturally. But from all this we observe that Mark Twain was living in a state of chronic nervous exasperation. Was this not due to the extraordinary number of repressions the life of pioneering involved? It is true that it was, in one sense, a free life. It was an irresponsible life. It implied a break with civilization, with domestic, religious, and political ties. Nothing could be freer in that sense than the society of the gold-seekers in Nevada and California, as we find it pictured in Roughing It. Free as that society was, nevertheless, scarcely any normal instinct could have been expressed or satisfied in it. The pioneers were not primitive men, they were civilized men, often of gentle birth and education, men for whom civilization had implied many restraints, of course, but innumerable avenues also of social and personal expression and activity to which their natures were accustomed. In escaping responsibility, therefore, they had only placed themselves in a position where their instincts were blocked on every side. There were so few women among them, for instance, that their sexual lives were either starved or debased, and children were as rare as the luck of Roaring Camp, a story that shows how hysterical, in consequence of these and similar conditions, the mining population was. Those who were accustomed to the exercise of complex tastes and preferences found themselves obliged to conform to a single monotonous routine. There were criminal elements among them, too, which kept them continually on their guard, and, at best, they were so diverse in origin that any real community of feeling among them was virtually impossible. In becoming pioneers they had, as Mr. Paine says, to accept a common mold, they were obliged to abdicate their individuality, to conceal their differences and their personal pretensions under the mask of a rough good fellowship that found expression mainly in the nervously and emotionally devastating terms of the saloon, the brothel, and the gambling hell. Mark Twain has described for us the gallant host which peopled this hectic scene, that army of erect, bright-eyed, quick-moving, strong-handed young giants, the very pick and choice of the world's glorious ones. Where are they now? he asks in roughing it. Scattered to the ends of the earth, or prematurely aged, or decrepit, or shot or stabbed in street affrays, or dead of disappointed hopes and broken hearts, all gone or nearly all, victims devoted upon the altar of the golden calf. We could not have a more conclusive proof of the total atrophy of human nature this old Nevada life entailed. Innumerable repressions, I say, produced the fierce intensity of that life, which burnt itself out so quickly. We can see this, indeed, in the fact that it was marked by an incessant series of eruptions, the gold-seekers had come of their own volition. They had to maintain an outward equilibrium. They were sworn, as it were, to a conspiracy of masculine silence regarding these repressions, of which, in fact, in the intensity of their mania, they were scarcely aware. Nevertheless, the human organism will not submit to such conditions without registering one protest after another. Accordingly, 
we find that in the mining camps the practical joke was as mr paine says legal tender profanity was almost the normal language and murder was committed at all hours of the day and night mark twain tells how in virginia city murders were so common that they were scarcely worth more than a line or two in the newspaper and almost every man in the town according to one of his old friends had fought with pistols either impromptu or premeditated duels we have just noted that for mark twain this life was a life of chronic nervous exasperation can we not say now that in a lesser degree it was a life of chronic nervous exasperation for all the pioneers but why what do we mean when we speak of repressions we mean that individuality the whole complex of personal desires tastes and preferences is inhibited from expressing itself from registering itself the situation of the pioneers was an impossible one but victims as they were of their own thirst for gold they could not withdraw from it and their masculine pride prevented them even from openly complaining or criticizing it in this respect as i have already pointed out their position was precisely parallel to that of soldiers in the trenches and like the soldiers in the trenches they were always on the verge of laughter which philosophers generally agree in calling a relief from restraint we are now in a position to understand why all the writers who were subjected to these conditions became humorists the creative mind is the most sensitive mind the most highly individualized the most complicated in its range of desires consequently in circumstances where individuality cannot register itself it undergoes the most general and the most painful repression the more imaginative a man was the more he would naturally feel himself restrained and chafed by such a life as that of the gold seekers he like his comrades was under the necessity of making money of succeeding the same impulse had brought him there that had brought everyone else we know how deeply mark twain was under this obligation an obligation that prevented him from attempting to pursue the artistic life directly because it was despised and because to have done so would have required just those expressions of individuality that pioneer life rendered impossible on the other hand sensitive as he was he instinctively recoiled from violence of all kinds and was thus inhibited by his own nature from obtaining those outlets in practical jokes impromptu duels and murder to which his companions constantly resorted mr paine tells us that mark twain never cared for duels and discouraged them and that he seldom indulged physically in practical jokes in point of fact he abhorred them when grown-up people indulge in practical jokes he wrote forty years later in his autobiography the fact gauges them they have lived narrow obscure and ignorant lives and at full manhood they still retain and cherish a job lot of leftover standards and ideals that would have been discarded with their boyhood if they had then moved out into the world and a broader life there were many practical jokers in the new territory after all those years he had not outgrown his instinctive resentment against the assaults to which his dignity had had to submit to mark twain in short the life of the gold fields was a life of almost infinite repression the fact as we have seen that he became a universal butt sufficiently proves how large an area of individuality as it were had to submit to the censorship of public opinion if he was to fulfill his pledge and make good in nevada here we have the psychogenesis of mark twain's humor an outlet of some kind that prodigious energy of his was bound to have and this outlet since he had been unable to throw himself wholeheartedly into mining had to be one which in some way however obliquely expressed the artist in him that expression nevertheless 
had also to be one which, far from outraging public opinion, would win its emphatic approval. Mark Twain was obliged to remain a good fellow in order to succeed, in order to satisfy his inordinate will to power, and we have seen how he acquiesced in the suppression of all those manifestations of his individuality, his natural freedom of sentiment, his love of reading, his constant desire for privacy, that struck his comrades as different or superior. His choice of a pen-name, as we have noticed, proves how urgently he felt the need of a protective coloration in this society where the writer was a despised type. Too sensitive to relieve himself by horseplay, he had what one might call a preliminary recourse in his profanity, those scorching, singeing blasts he was always directing at his companions, and that this in a measure appeased him we can see from Mr. Paine's remark that his profanity seemed the safety valve of his high-pressure intellectual engine. When he had blown off he was always calm, gentle, forgiving, and even tender. We can best see his humor, then, precisely as Mr. Paine seems to see it in the phrase, men laughed when they could no longer swear, as the expression in short of a psychic stage one step beyond the stage where he could find himself in swearing as a harmless moral equivalent, in other words, of those acts of violence which his own sensitiveness and his fear of consequences alike prevented him from committing by means of ferocious jokes, and most of Mark Twain's early jokes are of a ferocity that will hardly be believed by anyone who has not examined them critically, he could vent his hatred of pioneer life and all its conditions, those conditions that were thwarting his creative life. He could, in his vicarious manner, appease the artist in him, while at the same time keeping on the safe side of public opinion the very act of transforming his aggression into jokes, rendering them innocuous, and what made it a relief to him made it also popular. According to Freud, whose investigations in this field are perhaps the most enlightening we have, the pleasurable effect of humor consists in affording an economy of expenditure in feeling. It requires an infinitely smaller psychic effort to expel one's spleen in a verbal joke than in a practical joke, or a murder, the common method among the pioneers, and it is infinitely safer, too, a fact that instantly explains the function of the humorist in pioneer society and the immense success of Mark Twain. By means of those jokes of his, men were killed every week, says Mr. Paine, of one little contest of wit in which he engaged, for milder things than the editors had spoken each of the other, his comrades were able, without transgressing the law and the conventions, to vent their own exasperations with the conditions of their life and all the mutual hatred and the destructive desires buried under the attitude of good fellowship that was imposed by the exigencies of their work. As for Mark Twain himself, the protective coloration that had originally enabled him to maintain his standing in pioneer society ended by giving him the position which he craved, the position of an acknowledged leader. For, as I have said, Mark Twain's early humor was of a singular ferocity. The very titles of his Western sketches reveal their general character, The Dutch Nick Massacre, A New Crime, Lionizing Murderers, The Killing of Julius Caesar Localized, Cannibalism in the Cars, he is obsessed with the figure of the undertaker and his labors, and it would be a worthy task for some zealous aspirant for the doctor's degree to enumerate the occasions when Mark Twain uses the phrase, I brained him on the spot, or some equivalent. If the desire to kill and the opportunity to kill came always together, says Puddenhead Wilson, expressing Mark Twain's own frequent mood, who would escape hanging? His early humor, in short, was almost wholly aggressive. It began with a series of hoaxes, usually intended, says Mr. Paine, as a special punishment of some particular individual or paper or locality, but victims were gathered wholesale in their seductive web. He was 
unsparing in his ridicule of the governor, the officials in general, the legislative members, and of individual citizens. He became known, in fact, as a sort of general censor, and the officials, the corrupt officials, we gather that they were all corrupt except his own painfully honest brother Orion, were frankly afraid of him. He was very far, said one of his later friends, from being one who tried in any way to make himself popular. To be sure, he was. He was very far even from trying to be a humorist. Do we not recall the early youth of that most unhumorous soul, Henrik Ibsen, who, as an apothecary's apprentice in a little provincial town, found it impossible, as he wrote afterward, to give expression to all that fermented in me except by mad, riotous pranks, which brought down upon me the ill-will of all the respectable citizens, who could not enter into that world which I was wrestling with alone. Any young man with a highly developed individuality would have reacted in the same way. Mark Twain had committed the same mad, riotous pranks in his own childhood, and with the same effect upon the respectable citizens of Hannibal. If he had been as conscious as Ibsen, and had not been obliged by that old pledge to his mother to make terms with his environment, his antagonism would have ultimately taken the form not of humor, but of satire also. For it began as satire. He had the courage of the kindest of hearts, the humanest of souls. To that extent the poet was awake in him. His attacks on corrupt officials were no more vehement than his pleas on behalf of the despised Chinese, who were cuffed and maltreated and swindled by the Californians. In these attacks and these pleas alike he was venting the humane desires of the pioneers themselves. That is the secret of his daily philippics. San Francisco was weltering in corruption, and the settlers instinctively loathed this condition of things almost as much as did Mark Twain himself. They could not seriously undertake to reform it, however, because this corruption was an inevitable part of a social situation that made their own adventure their own success as gambling miners possible. The desire to change things, to reform things, was checked in the individual by a counter-desire for unlimited material success that throve on the very moral and political disorder against which all but his acquisitive instincts rebelled. In short, had Mark Twain been permitted too long to express his indignation directly in the form of satire, it would have led sooner or later to a reorientation of society that would have put an end to the conditions under which the miners flourished, not indeed as human beings, but as seekers of wealth. Consequently, while they admired Mark Twain's vehemence and felt themselves relieved through it, a relief they expressed in their storms of laughter and applause, they could not, beyond a certain point, permit it. Mark Twain, as we know, had been compelled to leave Nevada to escape the legal consequences of a duel. He had gone to San Francisco, where he had immediately engaged in such a campaign of muckraking that the officials found means, as Mr. Paine says, of making the writer's life there difficult and comfortless. As a matter of fact, only one of the several severe articles he wrote criticizing officials and institutions seems to have appeared, the result being that he lost all interest in his work on the San Francisco papers. When, on the other hand, he wrote about San Francisco as a correspondent for his paper in the rival community in Nevada, it was, we are told, with all the fierceness of a flaming indignation long restrained. His impulse, his desire, we see, was not that of the humorist, it was that of the satirist, but whether in Nevada or in California he was prohibited, on pain of social extinction, from expressing himself directly regarding the life about him. Satire, in short, had become for him as impossible as murder. He was obliged to remain a humorist. <laughs> 
in an old pamphlet about mark twain published in the eighties i discover the report of a phrenologist one professor beale of cincinnati who found the trait of secretiveness very strongly indicated in the diameter of his head just above the ears such testimony i suppose has no value but it is surely significant that this gentleman found the same trait exhibited in mark twain's slow guarded manner of speech perhaps we can understand now the famous mark twain drawl which he had inherited indeed but which people say he also cultivated perhaps we can understand also why it is that half the art of american humor consists in keeping one's face straight these humorists they don't know themselves how much they are concealing and they would be as surprised as anybody to learn that they are really social revolutionists of a sort who lack the courage to admit it mark twain once committed to the pursuit of success was obliged as i say to remain a humorist whether he would or no when he went east to carry on his journalistic career the publishers of the galaxy to which he became a regular contributor specifically asked him to conduct a humorous department and after the success of the innocents abroad his publisher bliss we find especially suggested and emphasized a humorous work that is to say a work humorously inclined we have already seen in a previous chapter that whatever was true of the pioneer society on the pacific slope was essentially true also of the rest of the american population during the gilded age that the business men of the east were in much the same case as the pioneers of the west the whole country as we know was as thirsty for humor as it was for ice water mark twain's humor fulfilled during its generation a national demand as universal in america as the demand fulfilled in russia by dostoevsky in france by victor hugo in england by dickens we have at last begun to approach the secret of this interesting fact i have spoken of the homogeneity of the american people during the gilded age mr howells has already related this to the phenomenon of mark twain's humor we are doubtless he says the most thoroughly homogeneous folk that ever existed as a great nation in our phrase we have somehow all been there when our humor mentions hash we smile because we have each somehow known the cheap boarding-house or restaurant when it alludes to putting up stoves in the fall each of us feels the grime and rust of the pipes on his hands we smile because in that because we have the whole story of mark twain's success the cheap boarding-house where every one has to pretend that he loves all his neighbors is the scene of many restraints and many irritations and as for the grime and rust of stove-pipes that is a sensation very far from pleasant sensitive men constrained by love and duty to indulge in these things have been known more than once to complain about them and even if the truth were known to cry bloody murder that was mark twain's habitual reaction as we can see from the innumerable sketches in which he wades knee-deep in the blood of chambermaids barbers lightning-rod men watchmakers and other perpetrators of the small harassments of life mark twain was more exasperated by these annoyances of everyday life than most people are because he was more sensitive but most people are exasperated by them also and as mr howells says all the american people of mark twain's time were exasperated by the same annoyances they were more civilized individually in short than the primitive environment to which they had to submit and mark twain's humor gave them face to face as they were with these annoyances the same relief it had given the miners in the west afforded them that is to say the same economy of expenditure in feeling we smile because that humor shows us that we are all in the same boat it relieves us from the strain of being unique and solitary sufferers 
and enables us to murder our tormentors in our imaginations alone, thus absolving us from the odious necessity of shedding the blood our first impulse prompts us to shed. Mr. Howells says that we have somehow all been there, a phrase which he qualifies by adding that the typical American of the last generation was the man who has risen. The man who has risen is the man who has become progressively aware of civilization, and the demands of the typical American of Mark Twain's time, the demands he made upon his environment, had become, pari passu, progressively more stringent, while the environment itself remained, perforce, just as barbarous and corrupt and unregenerate and annoying as ever. But why perforce? Because it was good for business. It was the environment favorable for a regime of commercial exploitation. Wasn't the man who has risen, the typical American himself, a businessman? Now, we have already seen that this process of rising in the world, of succeeding in business, is attained only at the cost of an all but complete suppression of individuality. The social effect of the stimulation of the acquisitive instinct in the individual is a general leveling down, and this is universally conceded to have been characteristic of the epoch of industrial pioneering. The whole nation was practically organized, by a sort of common consent, on the plan of a vast business establishment, under a majority rule, inalterably opposed to all the inequalities of differentiation, and to a moral and aesthetic development in the individual that would have retarded or compromised the success of the business regime. We can see, therefore, that if Mark Twain's humor was universally popular, it was because it contributed to the efficiency of this business regime, because it helped to maintain the psychic equilibrium of the businessman the country over, precisely as it had at first helped to maintain the psychic equilibrium of the Western pioneer. As a matter of fact, Mark Twain has often been called the businessman's writer. In that humor of his, as in no other literature, the strong, silent man, who is the archetype of the business world, sees an aid rather than a menace to his practical efficiency. But why does he find it an aid and not a menace? Let us put the question the other way, and ask why, in other forms of literature, he finds a menace and not an aid. The acquisitive and the creative instincts are, as we know, diametrically opposed, and, as we also know, all manifestations of the creative spirit demand, require, an emotional effort, a psychic cooperation, on the part of the reader or the spectator. This accounts for the businessman's proverbial hatred of the artist, a hatred that expresses itself in a contemptuous desire to shove him off the map. Every sort of spiritual expansion, intellectual interest, emotional freedom implies a retardation of the businessman's mental machinery, a retardation of the strenuous life, the life of pure action. Consequently, the businessman shuns everything that distracts him, confuses him, stimulates him to think or to feel. Bad for business. On the other hand, he welcomes everything that simplifies his course, everything that helps him to cut short his impulses of admiration, reverence, sympathy, everything that prevents his mind from opening and responding to the complications and the implications of the spiritual and intellectual life. And this is precisely what Mark Twain's humor does. It is just as irreverent as the Boston Brahmins thought, and especially irreverent toward them, when they gave him a seat below the salt. It degrades, takes down, punctures, ridicules as pretentious and absurd. Everything of a spiritual, aesthetic, and intellectual nature, the recognition of which, the participation in which, would retard the smooth and simple operation of the businessman's mind. Mark Twain, as we shall presently see, enables the businessman to laugh at art, at antiquity, at chivalry, at beauty, and return to his desk with an infinitely intensified conceit in his own worthiness and well-being. That is one aspect of his humor. In another aspect, 
he releases in a hundred murderous fantasies of which i have mentioned several all the spleen which the business life with its repression of individuality involves finally in his books about childhood he enables the reader to become a boy again just for a day to escape from the emotional stress of maturity to a simpler and more primitive moral plane. In all these respects, Mark Twain's humor affords that economy of expenditure in feeling, which, as we now perceive, the businessman requires as much as the pioneer. Glance now at a few examples of Mark Twain's humor. Let us see whether they corroborate this argument. In A Tramp Abroad, Mark Twain, at the opera in Mannheim, finds himself seated directly behind a young girl. How pretty she was, and how sweet she was! I wished she would speak, but evidently she was absorbed in her own thoughts, her own young girl dreams, and found a dearer pleasure in silence but she was not dreaming sleepy dreams no she was awake alive alert she could not sit still a moment she was an enchanting study her gown was of a soft white silky stuff that clung to her round young figure like a fish's skin and it was rippled over with the gracefulest little fringy films of lace. She had deep, tender eyes with long, curved lashes, and she had peachy cheeks and a dimpled chin, and such a dear little dewy rosebud of a mouth, and she was so dove-like, so pure, and so gracious, so sweet, and bewitching for long hours i did mightily wish she would speak and at last she did the red lips parted and out leaped her thought and with such a guileless and pretty enthusiasm too auntie i just know i've got five hundred fleas on me this bit of humor is certainly characteristic of its author. What is its tendency, as the psychologists say? Mark Twain has, one observes, all the normal emotions of a man confronted with a pretty girl. He has them so strongly, indeed, that he cannot keep his mind on the business in hand, which happens to be the opera. He finds himself, actually, prevented as he is from expressing himself in any direct way, drifting into a rhapsody about her. What does he do then? He suddenly dashes a pailful of ice water over this beautiful vision of his, cuts it short by a turn of the mind so sharp, so vulgar indeed, that the vision itself evaporates in a sudden jet of acrid steam. That young girl will no longer disturb the reader's thoughts. She has vanished as utterly as a butterfly under a barrel of quicklime. Beauty is undone and trampled in the dust but the strong, silent businessman is enabled to return to his labors with a soul purified of all troubling emotions. Another example, the famous esophagus hoax in the opening paragraph of A Double-Barreled Detective Story. It was a crisp and spicy morning in early October. The lilacs and laburnums, lit with the glory fires of autumn, hung burning and flashing in the upper air. A fairy bridge provided by kind nature for the wingless wild things that have their home in the treetops and would visit together. The larch and the pomegranate flung their purple and yellow flames in brilliant broad splashes along the slanting sweep of woodland the sensuous fragrance of innumerable deciduous flowers rose upon the swooning atmosphere far in the empty sky 
a solitary esophagus slept upon motionless wing everywhere brooded stillness serenity and the peace of god we scarcely need mr paine's assurance that the warm light and luxury of this paragraph are facetious the careful reader will note that its various accessories are ridiculously associated and only the most careless reader will accept the esophagus as a bird mark twain's sole and willful purpose one observes is to disturb the contemplation of beauty which requires an emotional effort to degrade beauty and thus divert the reader's feeling for it to degrade beauty to debase distinction and thus to simplify the life of the man with an eye single to the main chance that one would almost say is the general tendency of mark twain's humor in almost every one of his sallies as any one can see who examines them he burns the house down in order to roast his pig he destroys that is to say an entire complex of legitimate pretensions for the sake of puncturing a single sham and as a rule even the shams are not shams at all they are manifestations of just that personal aesthetic or moral distinction which any but a bourgeois democracy would seek in every way to cherish consider for example the value assailed in his famous speech on general grant and his big toe the effect of mark twain's humorous assault on the dignity of general grant was to reduce him not to the human but to the common level to puncture the reluctant reverence of the groundlings for the fact of moral elevation itself and the success of that audacious venture its success even with general grant was the final proof of the universal acquiescence of a race of pioneers in a democratic regime opposed in the name of business to the recognition of any superior value in the individual what made it possible was the fact that grant himself had gone the way of all flesh and become a business man the supreme example of mark twain's humor in this kind is however the connecticut yankee it was another of my surreptitious schemes for extinguishing knighthood by making it grotesque and absurd says the yankee sir ozana's saddle was hung about with leather hat-boxes and every time he overcame a wandering knight he swore him into my service and fitted him with a plug and made him wear it mark twain's contemporaries mr howells among them liked to imagine that in this fashion he was exposing shams and pretensions but unhappily for this argument knighthood had been long extinct when mark twain undertook his doughty attack upon it and it had no unworthy modern equivalent to exalt the plug above the plume was a very easy conquest for our humorist it was for this reason and not as mark twain imagined from any snobbish self-sufficiency that the english public failed to be abashed by the book in this respect at least the connecticut yankee was an assault not upon a social institution but upon the principle of beauty itself an assault moreover in the very name of the shrewd pioneer business man how easy it is now to understand the prodigious success of the innocents abroad appearing as it did precisely at the psychological moment at the close of the civil war at the opening of the epoch of industrial pioneering in the hour when the life of business had become obligatory upon every american man how easy it is to understand why it was so generally used as a guide-book by americans traveling in europe setting out only to ridicule the sentimental pretensions of the author's own pseudo-cultivated fellow-countrymen it ridiculed in fact everything of which the author's totally uncultivated fellow-countrymen were ignorant everything for which they wished just such an excuse to be ignorant where knowledge would have contributed to an individual development incompatible with success in business a knowledge that would have involved an expenditure in thought and feeling altogether too costly for the mind that was fixed upon the main chance 
it attacked not only the illegitimate pretensions of the human spirit but the legitimate pretensions also it expressly made the american business man as good as titian and a little better it made him feel that art and history and all the great elevated admirable painful discoveries of humankind were things not worth wasting one's emotions over oh the holy land yes but the popular biblical culture of the nineteenth century was notoriously as matthew arnold pointed out the handmaid of commercial philistinism and besides ancient palestine was hardly a rival in the civilization of modern america i find your people your best people i suppose they are very nice very intelligent very pleasant only talk about europe says a traveling englishman in one of howells's novels they talk about london and about paris and about rome there seems to be quite a passion for italy but they don't seem interested in their own country i can't make it out it was true true at least of the colonial society of new england and no doubt mark twain's dash of cold water had its salutary effect the defiant americanism of the innocents abroad marked almost as definitely as whitman's leaves of grass the opening of the national consciousness of which every one hopes such great things in the future but unlike leaves of grass having served to open it it served also to postpone its fruition its whole tendency ran precisely counter to whitman's in sterilizing that is to say instead of promoting the creative impulses in the individual it buttressed the feeble confidence of our busy race in a commercial civilization so little capable of commanding the true spiritual allegiance of men that they could not help anxiously inquiring every traveling foreigner's opinion of it here we have the measure of its influence both for good and for evil that influence was good in so far as it helped to concentrate the american mind upon the problems and the destinies of america it was evil and it was mainly evil in so far as it contributed to a national self-complacency to the prevailing satisfaction of americans with a banker's paradise in which as long as it lasts the true destinies of america will remain unfulfilled so much for the nature and the significance of mark twain's humor i think we can understand now the prodigious practical success it brought him and are we not already in a position to see why the role of humorist was foreign to his nature why he was reluctant to adopt it why he always rebelled against it and why it arrested his own development obviously in mark twain the making of the humorist was the undoing of the artist it meant the suppression of his aesthetic desires the degradation of everything upon which the creative instinct feeds how can a man everlastingly check his natural impulses without in the end becoming the victim of his own habit i have spoken of the connecticut yankee we know how mark twain loved the tales of sir thomas mallory they were to him a lifelong passion and delight as for knightly trappings he adored them think of his love for gorgeous costumes of the pleasure he found in dressing up for charades of the affection with which he wrote the prince and the pauper when therefore in his valiant endeavor to extinguish knighthood he sends sir hosanna about the country laying violent hands on wandering knights and clapping plugheads on their heads he is doing something very agreeable indeed to the complacent american business man agreeable to the business man in himself but an absolute violation of his own spirit that is why his taste remained infantile why he continued to adore knightly trappings instead of developing to a more advanced aesthetic stage his feelings for mallory we are told was one of reverence the reverence which he felt was the complement of the irreverence with which he acted one cannot degrade the undegradable one can actually degrade only oneself and the result of perpetually taking things down is that one remains down oneself 
and beauty becomes more and more inaccessibly up. That is why, in the pretense of art, Mark Twain always felt, as he said, like a barkeeper in heaven. In destroying what he was constrained to consider the false pretensions of others, he destroyed also the legitimate pretensions of his own soul. Thus his humor, which had originally served him as a protective coloration against the consequences of the creative life, ended by stunting and thwarting that creative life, and leaving Mark Twain himself a scarred child. He had, to the end, the intuition of another sort of humor. "'Will a day come?' asks Satan in The Mysterious Stranger when the race will detect the funniness of these juvenilities and laugh at them and by laughing at them destroy them for your race in its poverty has unquestionably one really effective weapon laughter power money persuasion supplication persecution these can lift at a colossal humbug push it a little weaken it a little century by century but only laughter can blow it to rags and atoms at a blast as a race do you ever use it at all no you lack sense and the courage it was satire that he had in mind when he wrote these lines the great purifying force with which nature had endowed him but of the use of which his life had deprived him how many times he confessed that it was he who lacked the courage how many times we have seen that if he lacked the courage it was because quite literally he lacked the sense the consciousness that is to say of his own powers of his proper function satire necessitates above all a supreme degree of moral maturity a supreme sense of proportion a free individual position as for Mark Twain, by reacting immediately to every irritating stimulus, he had literally sworn and joked away the energy, the indignation, that a free life would have enabled him to store up, the energy that would have made him not the public ventilator that he became, but the regenerator he was meant to be. Mr. Paine speaks of his high-pressure intellectual engine, let us follow the metaphor by saying that Mark Twain permitted the steam in his system to escape as fast as it was generated. He permitted it to escape instead of harnessing it till the time was ripe to blow to rags and atoms that world of humbug against which he chafed all his life. But he had staked everything upon the dream of happiness, and humor, by affording him an endless series of small assuagements, enabled him to maintain that equilibrium. "'I am tired to death all the time,' he wrote in 1895, out of the stress of his financial anxieties. With that in mind, we can appreciate the unconscious irony in Mr. Paine's comment. Perhaps, after all, it was his comic outlook on things in general that was his chief life-saver. End of chapter 9. Mark Twain's Humor Read by John Greenman. Chapter 10 of The Ordeal of Mark Twain by Van Wyck Brooks. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by John Greenman. Chapter 10. Let somebody else begin. No real gentleman will tell the naked truth in the presence of ladies. A double barreled detective story. I am persuaded that the future historian of America will find your works as indispensable to him as a French historian finds the political tracts of Voltaire. In these words, which he addressed to Mark Twain himself, Bernard Shaw suggested what was undoubtedly the dominant intention of Mark Twain's genius, the role which he was, if one may say so, pledged by nature to fulfill. He will be remembered, says Mr. Howells, with the great humorists of all time, with Cervantes, with Swift, 
or with any others worthy of his company. Voltaire, Cervantes, Swift. It was as a satirist, we perceive, as a spiritual emancipator, that those of his contemporaries who most generously realized him thought of Mark Twain. Did they not, under the spell of that extraordinary personal presence of his, in the magnetism, the radiance of what might be called his temperamental will to satire, mistake the wish for the deed? What is a satirist? A satirist, if I am not mistaken, is one who holds up to the measure of some more or less permanently admirable ideal the inadequacies and the deformities of the society in which he lives. It is Rabelais holding up to the measure of healthy-mindedness the obscurantism of the Middle Ages. It is Moliere holding up to the measure on an excellent sociality everything that is eccentric, inelastic, intemperate. It is Voltaire holding up to the measure of the intelligence the forces of darkness and superstition. It is a criticism of the spirit of one's age, and of the facts in so far as the spirit is embodied in them, dictated by some powerful, personal, and supremely conscious reaction against that spirit. If this is true, Mark Twain cannot be called a satirist. Certain of the facts of American life he did undoubtedly satirize, the state of American society and government his stories and articles present, says Miss Edith Wyatt, is, broadly speaking, truthfully characteristic of the state of society and government we find now in Chicago, the most murderous and lawless civil community in the world. What is exceptional in our great humorous view of our national life is not the ruffianism of the existence he describes for us on the Mississippi and elsewhere in the United States, but the fact that he writes the truth about it. Who will deny that this is so? Mark Twain satirizes the facts, or some of the facts, of our social life. He satirizes them vehemently. But when it comes to the spirit of our social life, that is quite another matter. Let us take his own humorous testimony. The silent, colossal national lie, that is, the support and confederate of all the tyrannies and shams and inequalities and unfairness that afflict the peoples, that is the one to throw bricks and sermons at but let us be judicious and let somebody else begin it has often been said that mark twain lost his nerve it ought to be sufficiently clear by this time however that he did not lose his nerve simply because in reality he had never found it he had never despite mr howells come into his intellectual consciousness at all he had never come into the consciousness of any ideal that could stand for him as a measure of the society about him. Moreover, he had so involved himself in the whole popular complex of the Gilded Age that he could not strike out in any direction without wounding his wife or his friends, without contravening some loyalty that had become sacred to him, without destroying the very basis of his happiness. We have seen that he had never risen to the conception of literature as a great impersonal instrument. An irresponsible child himself, he could not even feel that he had a right to exercise a will to satire that violated the wishes of those to whom he had subjected himself. Consequently, instead of satirizing the spirit of his age, he outwardly acquiesced in it and even flattered it. If anything is certain, however, it is that Mark Twain was intended to be a sort of American Rabelais, who would have done, as regards the puritanical commercialism of the Gilded Age, very much what the author of Pantagruel did as regards the obsolescent medievalism of the sixteenth century France. Reading his books and his life, one seems to divine his proper character and career embedded in the life of his generation as the bones of a dinosaur are embedded in a prehistoric clay bank. Many of the vertebrae are missing, other parts have crumbled away, 
We cannot with final certainty identify the portentous creature. But the dimensions help us, the skull, the thigh, the major members are beyond dispute. We feel that we are justified from the evidence in assuming what sort of being we have before us, and our imagination fills out in detail what its appearance must, or rather would, have been. When we consider how many of Mark Twain's yarns and anecdotes, the small change, as it were, of his literary life, had for their butt the petty aspects of the tribal morality of America, Sabbath-breaking, the taboos of the Sunday school, the saws of poor Richard's almanac, we can see that his birthright was of our age rather than of his own. Hear what he says of the late Benjamin Franklin. His maxims were full of animosity toward boys. Nowadays a boy cannot follow out a single natural instinct without tumbling over some of those everlasting aphorisms and hearing from Franklin on the spot. If he buys two cents worth of peanuts, his father says, Remember what Franklin has said, my son, a groat a day's a penny a year, and the comfort is all gone out of those peanuts. He delights in turning the inherited wisdom of the pioneers into such forms as this. Never put off till tomorrow what you can do day after tomorrow just as well. Here we have the note of Huckleberry Finn, who is not so much at war with the tribal morality as impervious to it, as impervious as a child of another epoch. He visits a certain house at night and describes the books he finds piled on the parlor table. One was Pilgrim's Progress, about a man that left his family. It didn't say why. I read considerable in it now and then. The statements was interesting, but tough. And again, speaking of a family dinner, Uncle Silas, he asked a pretty long blessing over it, but it was worth it, and it didn't cool it a bit, neither. The way I've seen them kind of interruptions do lots of times. One may say that a man in whom the continuity of racial experience is cut as sharply as these passages indicated it was cut in Mark Twain is headed straight for an inferior cynicism. But what is almost destiny for the ordinary man is the satirist's opportunity. If he can recover himself quickly, if he can substitute a new and personal ideal for the racial ideal he has abandoned, that solution of continuity is the making of him. For Mark Twain this was impossible. I have already given many instances of his instinctive revolt against the spirit of his time, moral, religious, political, economic. My idea of our civilization, he said freely and private, is that it is a shabby, poor thing, and full of cruelties, vanities, arrogancies, meanness, and hypocrisies. As for the word, I hate the sound of it. It conveys a lie. And as for the thing itself, I wish it was in hell, where it belongs." And consider this grave conclusion in one of his later letters. Well, the nineteenth century made progress, the first progress in ages and ages, colossal progress. In what? Materialities, prodigious acquisitions were made in things which add to the comfort of many and make life harder for as many more. But the addition to righteousness? Is that discoverable? I think not. The materialities were not invented in the interest of righteousness. That there is more righteousness in the world because of them than there was before is hardly demonstrable, I think. In Europe and America, 
there is a vast change due to them in ideals do you admire it all europe and all america are feverishly scrambling for money money is the supreme ideal all others take tenth place with the great bulk of the nations named money lust has always existed but not in the history of the world was it ever a craze a madness until your time and mine this lust has rotted these nations it has made them hard sordid ungentle dishonest oppressive who can fail to see that the whole tendency of mark twain's spirit ran precisely counter to the spirit of his age that he belonged as naturally in the opposition as i have said as all the great european writers of his time can we not also see accordingly that in stultifying him in keeping him a child his wife and his friends were the unconscious agents of the business regime bent upon deflecting and restraining a force which if it had matured would have seriously interfered with the enterprise of the industrial pioneering far from having any stimulus to satire therefore mark twain was perpetually driven back by the innumerable obligations he had assumed into the role that gave him as he said comfort and peace and to what did he not have to submit we shall have bloody work in this country some of these days when the lazy canal get organized they are the spawn of santerre and fouquier tinville we find thomas bailey aldridge writing to professor woodbury in eighteen ninety four there was the attitude of mark twain's intimates toward social and economic questions the literary confraternity of the generation was almost a solid block behind the financial confraternity in the moral and religious departments the path of the candidate for gentility was no less straight and narrow it took a brave man before the civil war says mr paine to confess he had read the age of reason mark twain observed once that he had read it as a cub pilot with fear and hesitation a man whose life had been staked on the pursuit of prestige in short could take no chances in those days the most fearful warnings followed mark twain to the end in eighteen eighty or thereabouts he saw his brother orion in the middle west excommunicated after a series of infidel lectures and condemned to eternal flames by his own church the presbyterian church huckleberry finn and tom sawyer were constantly being suppressed as immoral but in great centers in denver and omaha in 1903 in godly brooklyn as late as 1906 if the morals of those boys were considered heretical what would have been thought of mark twain's other opinions even the title he suggested for his first important book the new pilgrim's progress was regarded in hartford as a sacrilege the trustees of the american publishing company flatly refused to have anything to do with it and it was only when the money charmer bliss threatened to resign if he was not allowed to publish the book that these pious gentlemen who abhorred heresy but loved money more than they abhorred heresy gave in it was these same gentlemen who later became mark twain's neighbors and daily associates it was with them he shared that happy hartford society upon whose community of interests and unity of ideals the loyal mr paine is obliged to dwell in his biography was mark twain to be expected to attack them his spirit was indeed quiescent during the middle years of his life it is only in his early work and only in his minor work his sketches that we find smuggled in as it were among so many other notes the frank note of the satirist one recalls the promise he had made as a sort of oblique acknowledgment of his father-in-law's loan to the readers of his buffalo paper i only want to assure parties having a friendly interest in the prosperity of the journal that i am not going to hurt the paper deliberately and intentionally at any time 
I am not going to introduce any startling reforms, nor in any way attempt to make trouble. He, that rough western miner on probation, knew that he could not be too circumspect. And yet among those early sketches a risky note now and then intrudes itself. A mysterious visit, for example, that very telling animadversion upon a society in which thousands of the richest and proudest, the most respected, honored, and courted men lie about their income to the tax collector every year. Is it not the case, however, that as time went on he got into the habit of somehow not noticing these little spots on the American sun? In The Gilded Age, it is true, his first and only novel, he seems frank enough. One remembers the preface of that book. It will be seen that it deals with an entirely ideal state of society, and the chief embarrassment of the writers in this realm of the imagination has been the want of illustration. In a state where there is no fever of speculation, no inflamed desire for sudden wealth, where the poor are all simple-minded and contented, and the rich are all honest and generous, where society is in a condition of primitive purity, and politics is the occupation of only the capable and the patriotic, there are necessarily no materials for such a history as we have constructed out of an ideal commonwealth. That is fairly explicit and fairly animated, even if it is only a paragraph from a preface, and in fact the whole background of the story from the capital city, that grand old benevolent national asylum for the helpless, down with its devastating irony about every American institution save family life, Congress, the law, trial by jury, journalism, business, education, and the church, east and west alike, almost prepares us for Mark Twain's final verdict regarding the blessings of civilization trust. And yet the total effect of the book is idyllic. The mirage of the American myth lies over it like a rosy veil. Mark Twain might permit himself a certain number of acid glances at the actual face of reality, but he had to redeem himself. He wished to redeem himself for doing so, for the story was written to meet the challenge of certain ladies in Hartford, by making the main thread the happy domestic tale of a well-brought-up young man who finds in this very stubbly field the amplest and the softest straw for the snug family nest he builds in the end. Would he, for that matter, have presumed to say his say at all if he had not had the moral support of the collaboration of Charles Dudley Warner? Clemens, we are told, had the beginning of a story in his mind, but had been unwilling to undertake an extended work of fiction alone. He welcomed only too eagerly, therefore, the proposition of joint authorship. Mark Twain, the darling of the masses, brought Warner a return in money such as he probably never experienced again in his life. Warner, the respected Connecticut man of letters, gave Mark Twain the sanction of his name, an admirable combination, a model indeed, one might have thought it, for all New Englanders in their dealings with the West. Am I exaggerating the significance of what might be taken for an accident? In any case, it was not until that latter period, when he was too old and too secure in his seat to fear public opinion quite in this earlier way, that he had his revenge in The Man That Corrupted Hadleyburg. Not till then, and then only in a measure did he ever again, openly and on a large scale, attack the spiritual integrity of industrial America. Occasionally, in some little sketch like the great revolution in Pitcairn, where the Presbyterian Yankee is described as a doubtful acquisition, he ventures a pinprick in the dark. 
and we know that he sent his 1601 anonymously to a magazine editor who had once remarked, Oh, that we had a Rabelais! I judged, said Mark Twain, that I could furnish him one, but he had had his fingers burnt too often. He had no intention of persisting. It is notable, therefore, that having begun with contemporary society in the Gilded Age, he travels backward into the past for his subsequent pseudo-satirical themes. He feels free to express his social indignation only in terms of the seventh-century England of the Connecticut Yankee, the fifteenth-century England of the Prince and the Pauper, the fourteenth-century France of Joan of Arc, the sixteenth-century Austria of the Mysterious Stranger. Never again America, one observes, and never again the present for the first of these books alone contains anything like a contemporary social implication, and that, the implication of the Connecticut Yankee, is a flattering one. But I am exaggerating. Mark Twain does attack the present in the persons of the Tsar and King Leopold, whom all good Americans abhorred. As for his attacks on corruption in domestic politics, on the missionaries in China, was he not when he at last spoke out, supported by the leading citizens who are always ready to back the right sort of profit. Turn to Mr. Paine's biography. You will find Mr. Carnegie, whom he called St. Andrew, begging St. Mark for permission to print and distribute in proper form that sacred message about the missionaries. Mark Twain knew how to estimate the sanctity of his own moral courage. Do right he notes in his private memoranda, do right, and you will be conspicuous. Let us take one more instance, the supreme instance of Mark Twain's intention and failure in his predestined role, the Connecticut Yankee itself. This was his largest canvas, his greatest creative effort, the most ambitious and, in certain aspects, the most powerful of his works. Nothing could be more illuminating than a glance at his motives in writing it. What, in the first place, was his ostensible motive? The book, he says, in a letter to his English publisher, was not written for America. It was written for England. So many Englishmen have done their sincerest best to teach us something for our betterment that it seems to me high time that some of us should substantially recognize the good intent by trying to pry up the English nation to a little higher level of manhood in turn. No doubt if Mark Twain had read this over in cold blood he would have blushed for his own momentary priggishness. It was not characteristic of him to talk about higher levels of manhood but he was in a pet. Matthew Arnold had been wandering among us, with many deprecating gestures of those superangelic hands of his. Matthew Arnold must always have been slightly irritating. He was irritating even at home, and how much more irritating when, having visited this country, he chose to dwell upon the rudimentary language of General Grant. Mark Twain saw red an animadversion upon General Grant's grammar was an attack upon General Grant. An attack upon General Grant was an attack upon America. An attack upon America and upon General Grant was an attack upon Mark Twain, upon his heart as a friend of General Grant, upon his pocketbook as the publisher of General Grant, upon his amour propre as the countryman of General Grant. The pioneer in him rose to the assault like a bull buffalo in defense of the herd. Mark Twain relapsed into a typical Huck Finn attitude. He doubled his fists and said, You're another, just as he did a few years later in his reply to Paul Bourget. Then, longing for a pen warmed up in hell, he set to work to put those redcoats, Matthew Arnold, King George the Third, General Cornwallis, and all the rest of them, for by this time he was in the full furor of the myth of the American Revolution, in their place. 
he even began a frantic defense of american newspapers which at other times he could not revile enough and filled his notebooks with red-hot absurdities like this show me a lord and i will show you a man whom you couldn't tell from a journeyman shoemaker if he were stripped and who in all that is worth being is the shoemaker's inferior in short he covered both shoulders with chips and defied any and every englishman the whole english race indeed to come and knock them off now here i say is the crucial instance of mark twain's failure as a satirist in the moment of crisis the individual in him loses itself in the herd the intellect is submerged in a blind emotion that leads him unconsciously into a sort of bouleversement of all his actual personal intentions against his instinct against his purpose he finds himself doing not the things he really desires to do i e to pry up the american nation if the phrase must be used to a little higher level of manhood which is the true office of an american satirist but to flatter the american nation and lull its conscience to sleep in short instead of doing the unpopular thing which he really wanted to do he does the most popular thing of all he glorifies the yankee mechanic already in his own country surfeited with glory and pours ridicule upon the two things that least needed ridicule for the good of the yankee mechanic's soul if only because in his eyes they were sufficiently ridiculous already england and the middle ages could we have a better illustration of the betrayal of mark twain's genius if any country ever needed satire it is and was america did not mark twain feel this himself in those rare moments of his middle years when he saw things truly with his own eyes let us take from his letters a comment on american society that proves it there was absolutely nothing in the morning papers he writes in eighteen seventy three you can see for yourself what the telegraphic headings were by telegraph a father killed by his son a bloody fight in kentucky an eight-year-old murderer a town in a state of general riot a courthouse fired and three negroes therein shot while escaping a louisiana massacre two to three hundred men roasted alive a lively skirmish in indiana and thirty other similar headings the items under those headings all bear date yesterday april sixteenth refer to your own paper and i give you my word of honor that that string of commonplace stuff was everything there was in the telegraphic columns that a body could call news well said i to myself this is getting pretty dull this is getting pretty dry there don't appear to be anything going on anywhere has this progressive nation gone to sleep knowing as we do the significance of mark twain's humor we divine from the tone of these final comments that he already considers it none of his business that as a writer he proposes to do nothing about it but his eye is exceedingly wide open to those things would not any one say therefore that there is something rather singular in the spectacle of a human being living alertly in a land where such incidents were the staple of news and yet being possessed with an exclusive public passion to pry the english nation up to a little higher level of manhood isn't it strange to see the inhabitant of a country where negroes were being lynched at an average rate of one every four days filled with a holy fire of righteous wrath as mr paine says because people were unjustly hanged in the seventh century mark twain was sincerely angry there is no doubt about that 
but isn't it curious how automatically his anger was deflected from all its natural and immediate objects from all those objects it might have altered and turned like an aircraft gun upon the vacuity of space itself perhaps he says in what is man defining what he calls the master passion the hunger for self-approval perhaps there is something that man loves more than he loves peace the approval of his neighbors and the public and perhaps there is something which he dreads more than he dreads pain the disapproval of his neighbors and the public mark twain ate his cake and had it too he avoided the disapproval of his neighbors by not attacking america he won their approval by attacking england then as we can see from his famous letter to andrew lang he tried to win the approval of england also by deprecating the opinion of cultivated readers and saying that he only wanted to be taken as a popular entertainer i have never tried in even one single instance to help cultivate the cultivated classes and i never had any ambition in that direction but always hunted for bigger game the masses i have seldom deliberately tried to instruct them but i have done my best to entertain them for they can get instruction elsewhere that was what became of his noble purpose to pry up the english nation when the english nation manifested its objection to being pried up by virtually boycotting the book the wiles of simple folk they are the most successful of all the ironical part of this story for it is worth pursuing is that mark twain the sober individual had for england an exaggerated affection and admiration his first hour in england was an hour of delight he records of rapture and ecstasy i would a good deal rather live here if i could get the rest of you over he writes frankly in eighteen seventy two and mr paine adds that taking the snug island as a whole its people its institutions its institutions observe its fair rural aspects he had found in it only delight that was true to the end of his days against a powerful instinct he defended even the boer war because he so admired the genius of english administration he had personal reasons for this indeed in the affection with which england always welcomed him on no occasion in his own country we are told of his first english lecture tour had he won such a complete triumph and how many of those triumphs there were as a rule says mr paine english readers of culture critical readers rose to an understanding of mark twain's literary value with greater promptness than did the same class of readers at home indeed says mr howells it was in england that mark twain was first made to feel that he had come into his rightful heritage did his feeling for england spring from this who can say but certainly it was intense and profound early in his life he planned as we have seen a book on england and gave it up because he was afraid its inevitable humor would offend those who had taken him into their hearts and homes why then safely enthroned in america did he merely because he was annoyed with matthew arnold so passionately desire to pry the english nation up one key to this question we have already found but it requires a deeper explanation and the incident of this earlier book suggests it mark twain's literary motives and it was this as i have said that made him the typical pioneer were purely personal emerson wrote his english traits before the civil war in reporting his conversation with walter savage lander he made a remark that could not fail to hurt the feelings of robert southey what was his reason what was his excuse that southey and lander were public figures and that their values were values of public importance 
emerson in short instinctively regarded his function his loyalties and his responsibilities as those of the man of letters the servant of humanity mark twain no less typical of his own half-century took with him to england the pioneer system of values in which everything was measured by the ideal of neighborliness if he couldn't write without hurting people's feelings he wouldn't write at all for always like the good westerner he thought of his audience as the group of people immediately surrounding him in america on the other hand the situation was precisely reversed what would please his hartford neighbors who had taken him into their hearts and homes that was the point now and they or the less cultivated majority of them could not see england through the eyes of a connecticut yankee damned enough something mark twain knew he wanted to satirize he was boiling with satirical emotion and while the artist in him wished to satirize not england but america the pioneer in him wished to satirize not america but england and as usual the pioneer won another motive corroborated this decision he had published mr paine tells us nothing since the huck finn story and his company was badly in need of a new book by an author of distinction also it was highly desirable to earn money for himself elsewhere we read that the connecticut yankee was a book badly needed by his publishing business with which to maintain its prestige and profit mark twain the author we see had to serve the prestige and profit of mark twain the publisher he was obliged in short to write something that would be popular with the american masses how happy that publisher must have been for the provocation matthew arnold offered him mark twain on the top wave of his own capitalistic undertakings was simply expressing the exuberance of his own character not as an artist but as an industrial pioneer in the person of that east hartford yankee who sets out to make king arthur's england a going concern who can mistake this animus look at the opportunities here for a man of knowledge brains pluck and enterprise to sail in and grow up with the country the grandest field that ever was and all my own not a competitor prying up the english nation ends as we see with a decided general effect of patting the american nation on the back the satirist has joined forces with the great popular flood of his generation he has become that flood he asks neither the why nor the whither of his going he knows only that he wants to be in the swim if at that moment the artist in mark twain had had only the tail of one eye awake he would have laughed at the spectacle of himself drawing in dollars in proportion to the magnificence of his noble and patriotic defense of what everybody else less nobly perhaps but no less patriotically was defending also frankness is a jewel said mark twain only the young can afford it precisely at the moment when he was writing to robert ingersoll that remarkable letter which displayed a thirst for crude atheism comparable only to the thirst for crude alcohol of a man who has been too long deprived of his normal ration of simple beer he was at work on tom sawyer it is not a boy's book at all he says it will only be read by adults it is only written for adults six months later we find him adding i finally concluded to cut the sunday school speech down to the first two sentences leaving no suggestion of satire since the book is to be for boys and girls tell the truth or trump but get the trick almost incredible in fact to anyone who is familiar with the normal processes of the literary mind was mark twain's fear of public opinion that fear which was the complement of his prevailing desire for success and prestige in later life it was his regular habit to write two letters one of which he suppressed 
when he was addressing any one who was not an intimate friend upon any subject about which his instinctive feelings clashed with the popular view these unmailed letters in which as mr paine says he had let himself go merely to relieve his feelings and to restore his spiritual balance accumulated in such a remarkable way that finally as if he were about to publish them mark twain for his own amusement wrote an introduction to the collection will anybody contend he says that a man can say to such masterful anger as that go and be obeyed he is not to mail this letter he understands that and so he can turn on the whole volume of his wrath there is no harm he is only writing it to get the bile out so to speak he is a volcano imagining himself erupting does no good he must open up his crater and pour out in reality his intolerable charge of lava if he would get relief sometimes the load is so hot and so great that one writes as many as three letters before he gets down to a mailable one a very angry one a less angry one and an argumentative one with hot embers in it here and there tragic mark twain irresponsible child that he is he does not even ask himself whether he is doing right or wrong so unquestioningly has he accepted the code of his life and his friends that superb passion the priceless passion of the satirist is simply being wasted like the accumulated steam from an engine whose machinery has broken down and cannot employ it turn to one of these occasions when the charge of lava boiled up in mark twain compare the two unsent messages he wrote and the message he finally sent to colonel george harvey when the latter invited him to dine with the russian emissaries to the portsmouth conference in nineteen o five to understand them we must recall mark twain's opinion that the premature end of the russo-japanese war was entitled to rank as the most conspicuous disaster in political history feeling as he did that if the war had lasted a month longer the russian autocracy would have fallen he was bitterly opposed to the conference that had been arranged by roosevelt here are two telegrams he did not send to colonel harvey i am still a cripple otherwise i should be more than glad of this opportunity to meet those illustrious magicians who with the pen have annulled obliterated and abolished every high achievement of the japanese sword and turned the tragedy of a tremendous war into a gay and blithesome comedy if i may let me in all respect and honor salute them as my fellow humorists i taking third place as becomes one who was not born to modesty but by diligence and hard work is acquiring it mark dear colonel no this is a love feast when you call a lodge of sorrow send for me mark and this is the telegram he sent which pleased count witt so much that he announced he was going to show it to the czar to colonel harvey i am still a cripple otherwise i should be more than glad of this opportunity to meet the illustrious magicians who came here equipped with nothing but a pen and with it have divided the honors of the war with the sword it is fair to presume that in thirty centuries history will not get done admiring these men who attempted what the world regarded as impossible and achieved it mark twain another example 
In 1905 he wrote A War Prayer, a bitterly powerful fragment of concentrated satire. Hear what Mr. Paine says about it. To Dan Beard, who dropped in to see him, Clemens read The War Prayer, stating that he had read it to his daughter Jean and others, who had told him he must not print it, for it would be regarded as sacrilege. Still, you are going to publish it, are you not? Clemens, pacing up and down the room in his dressing-gown and slippers, shook his head. No, he said, I have told the whole truth in that, and only dead men can tell the truth in this world. It can be published after I am dead. He did not care, adds Mr. Paine, to invite the public verdict that he was a lunatic or even a fanatic with a mission to destroy the illusions and traditions and conclusions of mankind. The conclusions of mankind. And Mark Twain was a contemporary of William James. There was nothing in this prayer that any European writer would have hesitated for a moment to print. Well, I have a family to support, wrote this incorrigible playboy, who was always ready to blow thirty or forty thousand dollars up the chimney of some new mechanical invention. I have a family to support, and I can't afford this kind of dissipation. Finally there was the famous episode of the Gorky dinner. Mark Twain was always solicitous for the Russian people. He wrote stinging rebukes to the Tsar, rebukes in the Swinburnian manner, but informed with a far more genuine passion. He dreamed of a great revolution in Russia. He was always ready to work for it. When, therefore, Maxim Gorky came to America to collect funds for this purpose, Mark Twain gladly offered his aid. Presently, however, it became known that Gorky had brought with him a woman without benefit of clergy, hotel after hotel, with all the pious wrath that is so admirably characteristic of Broadway, turned them into the street. Did Mark Twain hesitate even for a moment? Did anything stir in his conscience? Did it occur to him that great fame and position carry with them a certain obligation, that it is the business of leaders to prevent great public issues from being swamped in petty personal ones? Apparently not. The author's dinner, organized in Gorky's honor, was hastily, and, with Mark Twain's consent, abandoned. An army of reporters, says Mr. Paine, was chasing Clemens and Howells, who appear on that page for all the world like a pair of terrified children. The Russian Revolution was entirely forgotten in this more lively, more intimate, domestic interest. What was Mark Twain's own comment on the affair? laws he wrote in a private memorandum can be evaded and punishment escaped but an openly transgressed custom brings sure punishment the penalty may be unfair unrighteous illogical and a cruelty no matter it will be inflicted just the same the efforts which have been made in Gorky's justification are entitled to all respect because of the magnanimity of the motive back of them. But I think that the ink was wasted. Custom is custom. It is built of brass, boiler iron, granite. Facts, reasonings, arguments have no more effect upon it than the idle winds have upon Gibraltar. What would Emerson or Thoreau have said fifty years before of such an argument, such an assertion of the futility of the individual reason in the face of brass, boiler iron, granite, and mob emotion? It is perhaps the most pitifully abject confession ever written by a famous writer. This is what became of the great American satirist, the Voltaire, the Swift, the Rabelais of the Gilded Age. If the real prophet is he who attacks the stultifying illusions of mankind, nothing, on the other hand, makes one so popular as to be the moral denouncer of what everybody else denounces. Of the real and difficult evils of society, Mark Twain, to be sure, knew little. 
He attacked monarchy, yes, but monarchy was already an obsolescent evil. And in any case this man, who took such delight in walking with kings, as the advertisements say, in actual life, never attacked the one monarch who really was, as it appeared, secure in his seat, the Kaiser. He attacked monarchy because, as he said, it was an eternal denial of the numerical mass of the nation. He had become, in fact, the incarnation of that numerical mass, the majority, which in the face of all his personal impulses he could not consider as anything but invariably right. He could not be the spokesman of the immensities and the eternities as Carlyle had been, for he knew them not. He could not be, like Anatole France, the spokesman of justice, for indeed he had no ideal. His only criterion was personal, and that was determined by his friends. On the whole, as Mr. Paine says, Clemens wrote his strictures more for relief than to print, and when he printed them it was because he had public opinion behind him. Revolt as he might, and he never ceased to revolt, he was the same man who, at the psychological moment in The Innocents Abroad, by disparaging Europe and its art and its glamorous past, by disparaging, in short, the history of the human spirit, had flattered the expanding impulse of industrial America. In the face of his own genius, in the face of his own essential desire, he had pampered for a whole generation that national self-complacency which Matthew Arnold quite accurately described as vulgar, and not only vulgar, but retarding. Glance at those last melancholy satirical fragments he wrote in his old age, those fragments which he never published, which he never even cared to finish, but a few paragraphs of which appear in Mr. Paine's biography. We note in them all the gestures of the great unfulfilled satirist he was meant to be. But they are empty gestures. Only an impotent anger informs them. Mark Twain's preoccupations are those merely of a bitter and disillusioned child. He wishes to take vengeance upon the Jehovah of the Presbyterians, to whom his wife has obliged him to pay homage. But the Jehovah of the Presbyterians, alas, no longer interests humanity. He is beset by all the theological obsessions of his childhood in Missouri. He has never even read literature and dogma. He does not know that the morbid fears of that old western village of his have ceased to trouble the moral conscience of the world. He imagines that he can still horrify us with his antiquated blasphemies. He has lived completely insulated from all the real currents of thought in his generation. The human being he says in one of his notes, needs to revise his ideas again about God. Most of the scientists have done it already, but most of them don't care to say so. He imagines, we see, that all the scientists have, like himself, lived in Hartford and Elmira, and married ladies like Mrs. Clemens, and, as, according to Mr. Paine, Nobody ever dared to contradict him or tell him anything. He never, dazzled as he was by his own fame, discovered his mistake. The religious folly you were born in, you will die in, he wrote once. He meant that he had never himself faced anything out. Was he or wasn't he a Presbyterian? He really never knew. If he had matured, those theological preoccupations, constantly imaged in his jokes and anecdotes about heaven, hell, and St. Peter, would have simply dropped away from his mind. His inability to express them had fixed them there, and his environment kept him constantly reacting against them to the end. Think of those chapters in his autobiography which he said were going to make people's hair curl. Several of them, at least, we are told, dealt with infant damnation. But whose hair in this twentieth century is going to curl over infant damnation? How little he had observed the real changes in public opinion, this man who lived instinctively all his life long in the atmosphere of the Western Sunday School. Tomorrow, 
he tells Mr. Paine in 1906, I mean to dictate a chapter which will get my heirs and assigns burnt alive if they venture to print it this side of A.D. 2006, which I judge they won't. And what he dictates is an indictment of the Orthodox God. He often spoke of the edition of A.D. 2006, saying that it would make a stir when it comes out, and even went so far as we have seen as to negotiate for the publication of his memoirs one hundred years after his death. He might have spared himself the trepidation. It is probable that by 1975 those memoirs will seem to the publishing world a very doubtful commercial risk. Mark Twain's view of man, in short, was quite rudimentary. He considered life a mistake and the human animal the contemptible machine he had found him. That argues the profundity of his own temperament, the depth and magnitude of his own tragedy, but it argues little else. The absurdity of man consisted, in Mark Twain's eyes, in his ridiculous conception of heaven and his conceit in believing himself the Creator's pet. But surely those are not the significant absurdities. His heaven is like himself, strange, interesting, astonishing, grotesque, he wrote in one of those pseudo-Swiftian letters from the earth, which he dictated with such fervor to Mr. Paine, I give you my word it has not a single feature in it that he actually values. It consists utterly and entirely of diversions which he cares next to nothing about here on the earth, yet he is quite sure he will like in heaven. Most men do not sing, most men cannot sing. Most men will not stay where others are singing if it be continued more than two hours. Note that. Only about two men in a hundred can play upon a musical instrument, and not four in a hundred have any wish to learn how. Set that down. Many men pray, not many of them like to do it. All men, sane or insane, like to have variety in their lives. Monotony quickly wearies them. Now, then, you have the facts. You know what men don't enjoy. Well, they have invented a heaven out of their own heads, all by themselves. Guess what it is like. How far does that satirical gesture carry us? It is too rustically simple in its animus, and its presuppositions about the tastes of humanity are quite erroneous. To sing, to play, and to pray in some fashion or other are universal, admirable, and permanent impulses in man. What is the moral even of that marvelous odyssey of Huckleberry Finn? That all civilization is inevitably a hateful error, something that stands in the way of life and thwarts it as the civilization of the Gilded Age had thwarted Mark Twain. But that is the illusion, or the disillusion, of a man who has never really known what civilization is, who, in The Stolen White Elephant, like H. G. Wells in his early tales, delights in the spectacle of a general smash-up of a world which he cannot imagine as worth saving because he has only seen it as a fool's paradise. What is the philosophy of the man that corrupted Hadleyburg, that every man is strong, as Mr. Paine says, until his price is named. But that is not true to the discriminating sense at all. It is an army of fifty-two boys that the Connecticut Yankee collects in order to start the English Republic. In childhood, and childhood alone, in short, had Mark Twain ever perceived the vaunted nobility of the race. The victim of an arrested development, the victim of a social order which had given him no general sense of the facts of life and no sense whatever of its possibilities, he poured vitriol promiscuously over the whole human scene. But that is not satire. 
That is pathology. Mark Twain's imagination was gigantesque. His eye, in later life, was always looking through the small end or the large end of a telescope. He oscillated between the posture of Gulliver in Lilliput and the posture of Gulliver in Brobdingnag. That natural tendency toward a magnification or a minification of things human is one of the earmarks of the satirist. In order to be effectual, however, it requires a measure, an ideal norm, which Mark Twain, with his rudimentary sense of proportion, never attained. It was not fear alone then, but an artistic sense also that led him to suppress, and indeed to leave incomplete, most of the works in which this tendency manifested itself. One recalls his Three Thousand Years Among the Microbes, passages of which have been published by Mr. Paine. Glance at another example. I have imagined, he said once, a man three thousand miles high picking up a ball, like the earth, and looking at it, and holding it in his hand. It would be about like a billiard ball to him, and he would turn it over in his hand and rub it with his thumb, and where he rubbed over the mountain ranges he might say, there seems to be some slight roughness here, but I can't detect it with my eye. It seems perfectly smooth to look at. There we have the Swiftian, the Rabelaisian note, the Rabelaisian frame for the picture that fails to emerge. The fancy exists in his mind, but he is able to do nothing with it. All he can do is to express a simple contempt, to rule human life, as it were, out of court. Mark Twain never completed these fancies precisely, one can only suppose, because they invariably led into this cul-de-sac. If life is really futile, then writing is futile also. The true satirist, however futile he may make life seem, never really believes it futile. His interest in its futility is itself a desperate registration of some instinctive belief that it might be, that it could be, full of significance, that, in fact, it is full of significance. To him, what makes things petty is an ever-present sense of their latent grandeur. That sense Mark Twain had never attained. In consequence, his satirical gestures remained mere passes in the air. End of chapter 10. Let somebody else begin. Read by John Greenman. Chapter 11 of The Ordeal of Mark Twain by Van Wyck Brooks. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by John Greenman. Chapter 11. Mustered Out. A man who awoke too early in the darkness, while the others were all still asleep. Dmitri Merchkovsky And so we come to Mark Twain's last phase, to that hour when, outwardly liberated at last from the bonds and the taboos that have thwarted him and distorted him, he turns and rends the world in the bitterness of his defeat. Three score years and ten he said in that famous seventieth birthday speech, it is the scriptural statute of limitations. After that you owe no active duties. For you the strenuous life is over. You are a time-expired man, to use Kipling's military phrase. You have served your term well or less well, and you are mustered out. What a conception of the literary career! You see how he looks back upon his life? A pilot in those days, he had written in Life on the Mississippi, was the only unfettered and entirely independent human being that lived in the earth. Writers of all kinds are manacled servants of the public. We write frankly and fearlessly, but then we 
modify before we print. In truth, every man and woman and child has a master, and worries and frets in servitude. But in the day I write of, the Mississippi pilot had none. No wonder he had loved that earlier career in which, for once and once only, he had enjoyed the indispensable condition of the creative life. As for the life of literature, it had been for him, and he assumed that it was for all, a life of moral slavery. We write frankly and fearlessly, but then we modify before we print. Shades of Tolstoy and Thomas Carlyle, of Nietzsche and Ibsen and Whitman, did you ever hear such words on the lips of a famous confrere? You whose opinions were always unpopular, did you ever once, in the angelic naivete of your souls, conceive the quaint idea of modifying a thought or a phrase because it annoyed some rich business man, some influential priest, some foolish woman? What were their flagellations, their gross and petty punishments to you? thrice armored in the inviolate immaterial aura of your own ingenuous truthfulness the rapt contemplation of your noble dreams look with pity then out of your immortal calm upon this poor frustrated child whom nature had destined to become your peer and who a swan born among geese never even found out what a swan was and had to live the goose's life himself. Yes, it is true that Mark Twain had never so much as imagined the normal existence of the artist, of the writer, who writes to please himself, and by so doing brings eternal joy to the best of humanity, to whom old age, far from being a release from irksome duties, brings only, amid faltering forces, a fresh challenge to the pursuit of the visions and the hopes of youth. You are a time-expired man, to use Kipling's military phrase. You have served your term. It is in the language of the barracks, of the prison, of an alien discipline at last escaped, that Mark Twain thinks of the writer's life, and you are mustered out. His first breathless thought was to tell the truth at last. Seventy years, he said again, is the time of life when you arrive at a new and awful dignity, when you may throw aside the decent reserves which have oppressed you for a generation, and stand unafraid and unabashed upon your seven-terraced summit, and look down and teach unrebuked. Huck Finn escaping from an unusually long and disagreeable session with Aunt Polly. That is the posture of Mark Twain, seventy years young, in this moment of release, of relief, of an abandon which with time has become filled with sober thoughts. To teach, unrebuked, unabashed, unafraid. Mr. Howells, referring to this period, speaks of a constant growth in the direction of something like recognized authority in matters of public import. Mark Twain was indeed accepted as a sort of national sage. But how is it possible for anyone who reads his speeches now, removed from that magnetic presence of his, to feel that he played this role in any distinguished way? Was he really the seer, the clairvoyant public counselor? He had learned to look with a certain perspective upon what he came to call this great, big, ignorant nation. The habitude of such power as he possessed, such experience of the world as he had had, and they were great in their way, showed him how absurd it was to spread the eagle any longer. There is something decidedly fresh and strong about those speeches still. He scouted the fatuous nonsense about American ideals, that becomes more and more vocal the more closely the one American ideal of all the people approaches the vanishing point. Good, sharp, 
honest advice he offered in abundance upon the primitive decencies of citizenship in this america the refuge of the oppressed from everywhere who can pay fifty dollars admission any one except a chinaman was he not courageous indeed this general spokesman of the epic of bishop potter and mrs potter palmer he who said do right and you will be conspicuous was the first to realize that his courage was of the sort that costs one little that passion for the limelight that inordinate desire for approval was a sufficient earnest that he could not even if he had so desired do anything essentially unpopular it was no accident therefore that his mind was always drifting back to that famous watermelon story which tens of thousands of living americans have heard him tell it appears three times in his published speeches he told how as a boy he had stolen a watermelon and having opened it and found it green returned it to the farmer with a lecture on honesty whereupon he was rewarded with the gift of another watermelon that was ripe it was the symbol of his own career for his courage and he frankly admitted it had always been the sort of courage he described in his story of luck tell the truth in short he could not his life had given him so little truth to tell his seventieth birthday had left him free to speak out and yet just as he played safe as a public sage so also he continued to play safe as a writer am i honest he wrote in that same seventy-first year to twichell i give you my word of honor privately i am not for seven years i have suppressed a book which my conscience tells me i ought to publish i hold it a duty to publish it there are other difficult duties which i am equal to but i am not equal to that one it was his bible what is man which as he had said some years before mrs clemens loathes and shudders over and will not listen to the last half nor allow me to print any part of it did he publish it at last yes anonymously and from that final compromise we can see that his mustering out had come too late he could not rouse himself indeed from the inertia with which old age and long habits of easy living had fortified the successful half of his double personality tolstoy at eighty set out on a tragic pilgrimage to redeem in his own eyes a life that had been compromised by wealth and comfort but the poet in tolstoy had never slumbered nor slept it had kept the conflict conscious it had registered its protest not sporadically but every day day in day out by act and thought it had kept its right of way open mark twain had lived too fully the life of the world the average sensual man had engulfed the poet like an old imprisoned revolutionist it faced the gates of a freedom too long deferred what visions of revolt had thrilled it in earlier years how it had shaken its bars but now the sunlight was so sweet the run of a little sap along those palsied limbs on his seventieth birthday mark twain was dazzled by his liberty he was going to tell the world the truth the whole truth and a little more than the truth within a week he found that he no longer had the strength glance at mr paine's record in eighteen ninety nine we find him writing as follows to mr howells for several years i have been intending to stop writing for print as soon as i could afford it at last i can afford it and have put the pot-boiler pen away what i have been wanting is a chance to write a book without reserves a book which should take account of no one's feelings and no one's prejudices opinions beliefs hopes illusions delusions a book which should say my say 
right out of my heart in the plainest language and without a limitation of any sort i judged that that would be an unimaginable luxury heaven on earth it is under way now and it is a luxury an intellectual drunk the book was the mysterious stranger while he was under the spell of composing it that sulphurous little fairy tale seemed to him the fruition of his desire but he was inhibited from publishing it and this only poured oil upon the passion that possessed him at once this craving reasserted itself with tenfold intensity he tinkered incessantly at what is man he wrote it and rewrote it he read it to his visitors he told his friends about it eventually he published this but the fact that he felt he was obliged to do so anonymously fanned his insatiable desire still more something more personal he must write now he fixed his mind on that with a consuming intensity to express himself was no longer a mere artistic impulse it had become a categorical imperative a path out of what was for him a life of sin with all my practice he writes humorously in one of his letters i realize that in a sudden emergency i am but a poor clumsy liar there is nothing humorous however in that refusal of his to continue tom sawyer's story into later life because he would only lie like all the other one-horse men in literature and the reader would conceive a hearty contempt for him there he expressed all the anguish of his own soul to tell the truth now what truth any and every kind of truth anything that would hurt him to tell and by so doing purge him we recall how he had adored the frankness of robert ingersoll how he had kept urging his brother orion to write an autobiography that would spare nobody's feelings and would let all the cats out of the bag simply tell your story to yourself laying all hideousness utterly bare reserving nothing he had told him let orion do it we can almost hear him whispering to himself and orion had done it it wrung my heart wrote mr howells of that astounding manuscript and i felt haggard after i had finished it the writer's soul is laid bare it is shocking mark twain had found a vicarious satisfaction in that he who at the same moment was himself attempting to write an absolutely faithful autobiography as mr paine tells us a document in which his deeds and misdeeds even his moods and inmost thoughts should be truly set down to write such a book now had become the ruling desire of his life he had developed what mr paine calls a passion for biography and especially for autobiography diaries letters and such intimate human history for confessions in a word he longed now not to reform the world but to redeem himself writing for print he speaks of that as of something unthinkable a man who writes for print he seems to say this man who spoke for free speech as the privilege of the grave becomes a liar in the mere act he is afraid of the public but he is more afraid now of himself whom he cannot trust he wishes to write not to read and plans a series of letters to his friends that are not going to be mailed you can talk with a quite unallowable frankness and freedom he tells himself in a little note which mr paine has published because you are not going to send the letter when you are on fire with theology you'll not write it to rogers who wouldn't be an inspiration you'll write it to twichell because it will make him writhe and squirm and break the furniture when you are on fire with a good thing that's indecent you won't waste it on twichell you'll save it for howells who will love it <laughs> 
as he will never see it you can make it really indecenter than he could stand and so no harm is done yet a vast advantage is gained was ever a more terrible flood piled up against the sluice gates of a human soul at last the gates open safely seated behind a proviso that it is not to be published until he has been dead a century mark twain begins his autobiography in the first flush he imagines that he is doing what he has longed to do work he said to a young reporter the passage is to be found in the collection of his speeches i retired from work on my seventieth birthday since then i have been putting in merely twenty-six hours a day dictating my autobiography but it is not to be published in full until i am thoroughly dead i have made it as caustic fiendish and devilish as possible it will fill many volumes and i shall continue writing it until the time comes for me to join the angels it is going to be a terrible autobiography it will make the hair of some folks curl but it cannot be published until i am dead and the persons mentioned in it and their children and grandchildren are dead it is something awful you see what he has in mind for twenty years his daily reading has been pepys and saint-simon and casanova he is going to have a spree a debauch of absolutely reckless confession he is going to tell things about himself he is going to use all the bold bad words that used to shock his wife his wife perhaps he is even going to be realistic about her why not has he not already in his letters said two or three playful things about her not incompatible with his affection but still decidedly wanting in filial respect st andrew carnegie and uncle joe cannon his affectionate old friend of the copyright campaign are fair game anyway and so are some of those neighbors in hartford and so are howells and rogers and twichell he is going to exact his pound of flesh for every one of that long list of humiliations but he is going to exact it like an olympian what is the use of being old if you can't rise to a certain impersonality a certain universality if you can't assume at last the prerogatives of the human soul lost in its loneliness and its pathos upon this little orb that whirls amid the swimming shadows and enormous shapes of time and space if you can't expand and contract your eye like the ghost you are so soon to be if you can't bring home for once the harvest of all your pains and all your wisdom as for that tearing booming nineteenth the mightiest of all the centuries what a humbug it was so full of cruelties and meannesses and lying hypocrisies what fun he's going to have what magnificently wicked fun you see mark twain's intention he is going to write for his own redemption the great book that all the world is thirsting for the book it will gladly however impatiently wait a hundred years to read and what happens he found it says mr paine a pleasant lazy occupation which prepares us for the kind of throbbing truth we are going to get twenty-six installments of that autobiography were published before he died in the north american review they were carefully selected no doubt not to offend the brimstone was held in reserve but as for the quality of that brimstone can we not guess it in advance he confessed freely says mr paine that he lacked the courage even the actual ability to pen the words that would lay his soul bare one paragraph in fact that found its way into print among the diffuse and superficial impressions of the north american review gives us we may assume the measure of his general candor 
I have been dictating this autobiography of mine daily for three months. I have thought of fifteen hundred or two thousand incidents in my life which I am ashamed of, but I have not gotten one of them to consent to go on paper yet. I think that that stock will still be complete and unimpaired when I finish these memoirs, if I ever finish them. I believe that if I should put in all or any of those incidents, I should be sure to strike them out when I came to revise this book. Bernard Shaw once described America as a nation of villagers. Well, Mark Twain had become the village atheist, the captain of his type, the Judge Driscoll of a whole continent. Judge Driscoll, we remember, could be a free thinker and still hold his place in society, because he was the person of most consequence in the community, and therefore could venture to go his own way and follow out his own notions. Mark Twain had proved himself superlatively smart. He was licensed to say his say, what inhibited him now, therefore, even more than his habits of moral slavery, was a sense, uh, how can we doubt it, a half-unconscious sense that, concerning life itself, he had little of importance to communicate. His struggle of conscience over the publication of What is Man points, it is true, toward another conclusion, but certainly the writing of his autobiography must have shown him that with all the will in the world, and with the freedom of absolute privacy, he was incapable of the grand utterance of the prophets and the confessors. There was nothing to prevent him from publishing Three Thousand Years Among the Microbes, the design of which was apparently free from personalities, if he had been sufficiently interested to finish it. He thought of founding a school of philosophy at Reading, like that other school at Concord, but none of these impulses lasted. His prodigious market value confirmed him at moments, no doubt, in thinking himself a nester, but something within this tragic old man must have told him that he was not really the sage, the seer, and that mankind could well exist without the discoveries and the judgments of that gregarious pilgrimage of his. It is noble to be good, he said during these later years, but it is nobler to show others how to be good, and less trouble which conveys in its cynicism a profound sense of his own emptiness. He tempted the fates when he published What is Man, anonymously. If that book had had a success of scandal, his conscience might have pricked him on to publish more. Immature as his judgment was, he had no precise knowledge of the value of his ideas, but at least he knew that great ideas usually shock the public, and that if his ideas were great, they would probably have that gratifying effect. Fortunately or unfortunately, the book was received, says Mr. Paine, as a clever and even brilliant expose of philosophies which were no longer startlingly new. And after that just, that very generous public verdict, for the book is, in fact, quite worthless except for the light it throws on Mark Twain, he must have felt that he had no further call to adopt the unpopular role of Mephistopheles. With all the more passion, however, his balked fury, the animus of the repressed satirist in him, turned against the harsher aspects of that civilization which had tied his tongue. Automatically, as we have seen from the incidents of the Gorky dinner and the Portsmouth conference and the war prayer, restraining those impulses that were not supported by the sentiment of a safe majority, he threw himself, with his warm heart and his quick pulse, into the defense of all that are desolate and oppressed. The human race was behaving very badly, says Mr. Paine, of the hour of his triumphant return to America in 1900. Unspeakable corruption was rampant in the city. The Boers were being oppressed in South Africa.' 
the natives were being murdered in the philippines leopold of belgium was massacring and mutilating the blacks in the congo and the allied powers in the cause of christ were slaughtering the chinese the human race had always been behaving badly but mark twain was in a frame of mind to perceive it now was he the founder of the great school of muckrakers he at any rate the most sensitive the most humane of men rode forth to the encounter now the champion of all who like himself had been in bondage it is impossible to ignore this personal aspect of his passionate sympathy with suffering and weakness in any form whether in man or beast in these later years it was the spectacle of strength triumphing over weakness that alone aroused his passion or even save in his autobiographic and philosophic attempts induced him to write one remembers those pages in following the equator about the exploitation of the kanakas then there was his book about king leopold and the congo and the czar's soliloquy and a horse's tale written for mrs fiske's propaganda against bullfighting in spain the dreyfus case was an obsession with him finally among many other writings of a similar tendency there was his joan of arc in which he had summed up a lifetime's rage against the forces in society that array themselves against the aspiring spirit joan of arc has always been a favorite theme with old men old men who have dreamed of the heroic life perhaps without ever attaining it the sharp realism of anatole france's biography which so infuriated mark twain was if he had known it the prerogative of a veteran who equally as the defender of dreyfus the comrade of joannes and the volunteer of nineteen fourteen has proved that skepticism and courage are capable of a superb rapport mark twain had not been able to rise to that level and the sentimentality of his own study of joan of arc shows it in his animus against the judges of joan one perceives however a savage and despairing defense of the misprized poet the betrayed hero in himself the outstanding fact about this later effort of mark twain's is that his energy is concentrated almost exclusively in attacks of one kind or another his mind whether good or ill has become thoroughly destructive he is consumed by a will to attack a will to abolish a will to destroy sometimes he had written a few years earlier my feelings are so hot that i have to take the pen and put them out on paper to keep them from setting me afire inside he who had become definitely a pessimist we are told at forty-eight in the hour of his great prosperity was possessed now with a rage for destruction who can doubt that this was pathological he was so promiscuous in his attacks had he not as early as eighteen eighty one assailed even the postage rates had he not been thrown into a fury by an order from the post office department on the superscription of envelopes there were whole days one is told when he locked himself up in his rooms and refused to see his secretary when he was like a raging animal consumed with a blind and terrible passion of despair we can hear his leonine roars even in the gentle pages of his biographer mr paine tells how he turned upon him one day and said fiercely anybody that knows anything knows that there was not a single life that was ever lived that was worth living and again i have been thinking it out if i live two years more i will put an end to it all i will kill myself was that a pose as mr howells says was it a mere humorous fancy that plan for exterminating the human race by withdrawing all the oxygen from the earth for two minutes was it a mere impersonal sympathy for mankind that perpetual search for means of easement and alleviation that obsessed interest in christian science in therapeutics was it not all in that sound and healthy frame the index of a soul that was mortally sick 
Mark Twain's attack upon the failure of human life was merely a rationalization of the failure in himself, and this failure was the failure of the artist in him. Glance back thirty years. Hear what he writes to Mr. Howells from Italy in 1878. I wish I could give those sharp satires on European life which you mention, but of course a man can't write successful satire except he be in a calm, judicial, good humor, whereas I hate travel, and I hate hotels, and I hate the opera, and I hate the old masters. In truth, I don't ever seem to be in a good enough humor with anything to satirize it. No, I want to stand up before it and curse it and foam at the mouth or take a club and pound it to rags and pulp. I have got in two or three chapters about Wagner's operas and managed to do it without showing temper, but the strain of another such effort would burst me. That is what had become of the satirist. That is what had become of the artist, thirty years before he, the unconscious sycophant of the crass materialism of the Gilded Age, who had, in the Innocents Abroad, poured ignorant scorn upon so many of the sublime creations of the human spirit, he the playboy, the comrade and emulator of magnates, and wire-pullers, had begun even then to pay with an impotent fury for having transgressed his own instincts unawares. A born artist ridiculing art, a born artist hating art, a born artist destroying art. There we have the natural evolution of a man who, in the end, wishes to destroy himself and the world. How angrily suspicious he is, even this early, of all aesthetic pretensions! What a fierce grudge he has against those who lay claim to a certain affection for the perverse mysteries of high art! They want to get into the dress circle, he says, by a lie. That's what they're after. The slave-ship, for all Ruskin's fine phrases, reminds him of a cat having a fit in a platter of tomatoes, etc., etc. Here we have the familiar figure of the peasant who imagines a woman must be a prostitute because she wears a low-cut dress. But the peasant spits on the ground and walks on. Mark Twain cannot take it so lightly. That low-cut dress is a red rag to him. He foams and stamps wherever he sees it. Is it not evident that he is the prey of some appalling repression? It is not in the nature of man to desire a club so that he can pound works of art into rags and pulp, unless they are the symbols of something his whole soul unconsciously desires to create, and has been prevented from creating. Do we ask, then, why Mark Twain detested novels? It was because he had been able to produce only one himself, and that a failure. We can understand now that intense will of to believe in the creative life which Mark Twain revealed in his later writings. Man originates nothing, not even a thought. Shakespeare could not create. He was a machine, and machines do not create. Is it possible to mistake the animus in that? Mark Twain was an ardent Baconian. In that faith he said, I find comfort, solace, peace, and never-failing joy. I will say nothing of the complete lack of intuition concerning the psychology of the artist revealed in his pamphlet, Is Shakespeare Dead? It is astonishing that any writer could have composed this that any one but a retired businessman or a lawyer infatuated with rationalization could have so misapprehended the nature and the processes of the poetic mind. But Mark Twain does not write like a credulous businessman, indulging his hobby. He does not even write like a lawyer, feverishly checking off the proofs of that intoxicating evidence. 
he is defiant he exults in the triumph of his own certitude he stamps on shakespeare he insults him he delights in pouring vulgar scorn upon that ingenuous bust in stratford church with its deep 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 subtle 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 expression of a bladder and why because the evidence permits him to believe that shakespeare was an ignorant yokel bacon was the man bacon knew everything bacon was a lawyer see what macaulay says macaulay heaven bless us all therefore bacon wrote the plays is this mark twain speaking the author of the sublime illiteracies of huckleberry finn who had been himself most the artist when he was least the sophisticated citizen it is and he is speaking in character he who asserted that man is a chameleon and is nothing but what his training makes him had long lost the intuition of the poet and believed perforce that without bacon's training those plays could not have been written but would he have stamped with such a savage joy upon that yokel shakespeare if the fact as he imagined that man creates nothing had not had for him a tragic however unconscious significance one can hardly doubt that when one considers that mark twain was never able to follow the bacon ciphers when one considers the emotional prepossession revealed in his own statement that he accepted those ciphers mainly on faith how simple it becomes now the unraveling of that mournful philosophy of his that drab mass of crude speculation of which he said so confidently that it was like the sky you can't break through anywhere how much it meant to him the thought that man is a mere machine an irresponsible puppet entitled to no demerit for what he has failed to do da homie he says somewhere could not find an edison out in da homie an edison could not find himself out broadly speaking genius is not born with sight but blind and it is not itself that opens its eyes but the subtle influences of a myriad of stimulating exterior circumstances what a comment side by side with mark twain's life upon mr howells's statement that the world in which he came into his intellectual consciousness was large and free and safe large for the satirist with mrs clemens free with mr howells himself and safe with h h rogers if shakespeare had been born and bred on a barren and unvisited rock in the ocean his mighty intellect would have had no outside material to work with and could have invented none and no outside influences teachings moldings persuasions inspirations of a valuable sort and could have invented none and so shakespeare would have produced nothing in turkey he would have produced something something up to the highest limit of turkish influences associations and training in france he would have produced something better something up to the highest limit of the french influences and training mark twain fails to mention what would have happened to shakespeare if he had been born in america he merely adds but it is enough you and i are but sewing machines we must turn out what we can we must do our endeavor and care nothing at all when the unthinking reproach us for not turning out goblins there we have his half-conscious verdict on the destiny of the artist in a society as large and free and safe as that of the gilded age yes the 
tragic thing about an environment as coercive as ours is that we are obliged to endow it with the majesty of destiny itself in order to save our own faces we dwell on the conditions that hamper us destroy us we embrace them with an amour fati to escape from the contemplation of our own destruction outside influences outside circumstances wind the man and regulate him left to himself he wouldn't get regulated at all and the sort of time he would keep would not be valuable there is the complete philosophy of the moral slave who not only has no autonomy but wishes to have none who in fact finds all his comfort in having none and delights in denying the possibility of independence just because he does not possess it himself the pragmatists have escaped this net in their own interestingly temperamental fashion like flying fish by jumping over it it remains nevertheless the characteristic philosophy of americans who have a deep emotional stake in the human situation and one might almost say that it honors mark twain we only perceive we are only mortified by the slavery of men when nature has endowed us with the true hunger and thirst for freedom who can doubt indeed that it was the very greatness of his potential force the strength of his instinctive preferences that confirmed in mark twain his inborn calvinistic will to despise human nature that fixed in him the obsession of the miscarriage of the human spirit if the great artist is the freest man if the true creative life is in fact the embodiment of free will then it is only he that is born for greatness who can feel as mark twain felt that the universe is leagued against him the common man has no sense of having surrendered his will he regards it as a mere pretension of the philosophers that man has a will to surrender he eats drinks and continues to be merry or morose regardless of his moral destiny to possess no principle of growth no spiritual backbone is indeed his greatest advantage in a world where success is the reward of accommodation it is nothing to him that man is a chameleon who by the law of his nature takes the color of his place of resort it is nothing to him whether or not as mark twain said the first command the deity issued to a human being on this planet was be weak be water be characterless be cheaply persuadable knowing that adam would never be able to disobey it is nothing to him or rather it is much for it is by this means that he wins his worldly prestige how well for that matter it served the prevailing self in mark twain from the cradle to the grave during all his waking hours the human being is under training it is his human environment which influences his mind and his feelings furnishes him his ideals and sets him on his road and keeps him in it if he leave that road he will find himself shunned by the people whom he most loves and esteems and whose approval he most values the influences about him create his preferences his aversions his politics his tastes his morals his religion he creates none of these things for himself poor mark twain that is the way of common flesh but only the great spirit so fully apprehends the tragedy of it nothing consequently could be more pathetic than the picture mark twain draws in what is man and in his later memoranda of the human mind it is really his own mind he is describing and one cannot imagine anything more unlike the mind of the mature artist which is all of a single flood all poise all 
natural control. You cannot keep your mind from wandering if it wants to. It is master, not you. The mind carries on thought on its own hook. We are automatic machines which act unconsciously. From morning till sleeping time all day long, all day long our machinery is doing things from habit and instinct, and without requiring any help or attention from our poor little seven-by-nine thinking apparatus. Man has habits, and his habits will act before his thinking apparatus can get a chance to exert its powers. Mark Twain cannot even conceive of the individual reacting as the mature man, as the artist preeminently does upon his instinctive life and controlling it for his own ends. He shows us the works of his mental machine, racing along from subject to subject, a drifting panorama of ever-changing, ever-dissolving views manufactured by my mind without any help from me. Why, it would take me two hours to merely name the multitude of things my mind tallied off and photographed in fifteen minutes. The mind? Man has no control over it. It does as it pleases. It will take up a subject in spite of him. It will stick to it in spite of him. It will throw it aside in spite of him. It is entirely independent of him. Does he call himself a machine? He might better have said a merry-go-round without the rhythm of a merry-go-round. Mark Twain reveals himself in old age as a prey to all manner of tumbling, chaotic obsessions. His mind rings with rhymes he cannot banish, sticks and stumbles over chess problems he has no desire to solve. It wouldn't listen. It played right along. It wore me out, and I got up haggard and wretched in the morning. A swarming mass of dissociated fragments of personality, an utterly disintegrated spirit, a spirit that has lost, that has never possessed, the principle of its own growth. Always in these speculations, however, we find two major personalities at war with each other. One is the refractory self that wants to publish the book regardless of consequences. The other is the insolent, absolute monarch inside of a man who is the man's master, and who forbids it. The eternal conflict of Huckleberry Finn and Aunt Polly playing itself out to the end in the theater of Mark Twain's soul. The interpretation of dreams is a very perilous enterprise. Contemporary psychology hardly permits us to venture into it with absolute assurance. And yet we feel that without doubt our unconscious selves express through this distorting medium their hidden desires and fears. I generally enjoy my dreams, Mark Twain once told Mr. Paine, but not those three and they are the ones I have oftenest. He wrote out these three recurrent dreams in a memorandum. One of them is long, and to me at least without obvious significance, but one cannot fail to see in the other two a singular corroboration of the view of Mark Twain's life that has been unfolded in these pages. There is never a month passes, he wrote, that I do not dream of being in reduced circumstances and obliged to go back to the river to earn a living. It is never a pleasant dream, either. I love to think about those days, but there's always something sickening about the thought. <laughs> 
that I have been obliged to go back to them, and usually in my dream I am just about to start into a black shadow without being able to tell whether it is Selma Bluff or Hat Island or only a black wall of night. Another dream that I have of that kind is being compelled to go back to the lecture platform. I hate that dream worse than the other. In it I am always getting up before an audience with nothing to say, trying to be funny, trying to make the audience laugh, realizing that I am only making silly jokes. Then the audience realizes it, and pretty soon they commence to get up and leave. That dream always ends by my standing there in the semi-darkness talking to an empty house. I leave my readers to expound these dreams according to the formulas that please them best. I wish to note only two or three points. Mark Twain is obsessed with the idea of going back to the river. I love to think about those days. But there is something sickening in the thought of returning to them, too, and that is because of the black shadow, the black wall of night into which he, the pilot, sees himself inevitably steering. That is a precise image of his life. The second dream is its natural complement. On the lecture platform his prevailing self had reveled in its triumphs, and, he says, I hate that dream worse than the other. Had he ever wished to be a humorist? He is always trying to make the audience laugh. The horror of it is that he has lost in his nightmare the approval for which he had made his great surrender. Turn again to the last pages in Mr. Paine's biography, to the moment when he lay breathing out his life in the cabin of that little Bermuda packet. Two dreams beset him in his momentary slumber, one of a play in which the title role of the general manager was always unfilled. He spoke of this now and then when it had passed, and it seemed to amuse him. The other was a discomfort. A college assembly was attempting to confer upon him some degree which he did not want. Once, half aroused, he looked at me searchingly and asked, Isn't there something I can resign and be out of all this? They keep trying to confer that degree upon me, and I don't want it. Then, realizing, he said, I am like a bird in a cage, always expecting to get out, and always beaten back by the wires. No, Mark Twain's seventieth birthday had not released him. It would have had to release him from himself. It cut away the cords that bound him, but the tree was not flexible any more. It was old and rigid, fixed for good and all, and it could not redress the balance. In one pathetic excess alone the artist blossomed, that costume of white flannels, the temerity of which so shocked Mr. Howells in Washington. I should like, said Mark Twain, to dress in a loose and flowing costume made all of silks and velvets resplendent with stunning dyes. So would every man I have ever known, but none of us dares to venture it. There speaks the born artist, the starved artist, who for forty years has had to pretend that he was a businessman, the born artist who has always wanted to be original in his dress, and has had to submit to a feverish censorship even over his neckties. The artist who, longing to look like an orchid, has the courage at last, and at least, to emulate the modest lily. And so we see Mark Twain, with his dry and dusty heart, washing about on a forlorn sea of banquets and speech-making. The saddest, 
the most ironical figure in all the history of this western continent the king the conquering hero the darling of the masses praised and adored by all he is unable even to reach the cynic's paradise that vitriolic sphere which has after all a serenity of its own the playboy to the end divided between rage and pity cheerful in his self-contempt an illusionist in the midst of his disillusion he is the symbol of the creative life in a country where by the goodness of god we have those three unspeakably precious things freedom of speech freedom of conscience and the prudence never to practice either of them he is the typical american people have said let heaven draw its own conclusions as for ourselves we are permitted to think otherwise he was the supreme victim of an epoch in american history an epoch that has closed has the american writer of today the same excuse for missing his vocation he must be very dogmatic or unimaginative says john ingleton with a prophetic note that has ceased to be prophetic who would affirm that man will never weary of the whole system of things which reigns at present we never know how near we are to the end of any phase of our experience and often when its seeming stability begins to pall upon us it is a sign that things are about to take a new turn read writers of america the driven disenchanted anxious faces of your sensitive countrymen remember the splendid parts your confreres have played in the human drama of other times and other peoples and ask yourselves whether the hour has not come to put away childish things and walk the stage as poets do end of chapter eleven mustered out and end of the ordeal of mark twain by van wick brooks read by john greenman